You're very welcome today, those people here in person. Thanks so much for making it and those online. Um, so just to start off with a little bit of background. So FAO and um, the Institute for, <clears throat> excuse me, Innovation on Public Purpose. We've been uh, collaborating together for just over a year. Um, and um, in during this uh, time, we've um, had the pleasure of um, holding workshops with um, the colleagues from IIPP um, in person. Uh, they they came in October last year, supported the um, delivery and development of a training on um, tools. Um, on systems thinking for policymakers. And um, then we met again and had the, the pleasure of the collaboration again in, in Rwanda, um, where the um, further development and, and co creation um, continued with high level policymakers in Rwanda. Um, and then again today, and today we're going to hone in on the topic of policy coherence. Um, so uh, just to give a, a little bit of um, background in terms of the agenda for today. Um, so we'll start off, I'll just give a, a little presentation on uh, FAO's work on policy making um, for agri-food systems collaboration. Um, the, after uh, Corinna Hawkes, the director of the Agri-Food Systems and Food Safety Division opens the meeting. Um, and then we will um, pass over to Professor Rainer Cathal, who will uh, provide a, a presentation to us um, on um, frameworks um, and policy and capabilities for, for policymakers on agri-food systems transformation. Um, then we also have the um, honor of having um, a presentation on research carried out by uh, four uh, master's students on public policy um, at the Institute. Um, uh, and uh, you'll present yourselves later. Uh, but just to say that this event today is part of their evaluation and that we'll have um, other um, staff from IIPP online um, who will be um, uh, yeah, evaluating. So the, the very best of luck um, with that. Marking, marking process, so no pressure. <laughs> and um, that discussion then will be moderated uh, by my colleague, Elena Ilya, um, and then uh, the Deputy Director of uh, the Agri-Food Systems and Food Safety Division will um, close the meeting some closing remarks. Okay, so without any further ado, I pass over to Karina, uh, who will give us uh, the opening remarks for today's seminar. Thanks, Thank Karina. You. Thank you, Siobhan, and welcome to everyone. Uh, good, to, good to see you here, and of course, welcome very much in particular to our uh, partners from University uh, uh, College, uh, College London. It's great to be with us. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining. Uh, thanks for joining us. So when it comes to uh, incoherence in food systems, I think there are many examples that many of us can see um, when we're thinking about agri-food systems um, as a whole. And one of the examples um, that I always think illustrates uh, incoherence well uh, comes from um, the case of, of palm oil. It's a, an example that I've uh, talked about for, for quite some years. Um, and it illustrates several things. I mean, if you think about um, palm oil being uh, produced, uh, it's a nutritious oil when it's produced, but when it's hydrolyzed, it becomes a white powder that uh, is harmful to health. And um, at the same time, so that's the, the concern on behalf of people who are concerned about health. Then you have environmental activists and others uh, concerned about the environmental impacts of palm oil and all of the issues of dead orangutans and so on that that was seen. Um, and at the same time, you have the international financial institutions um, uh, investing uh, into palm oil um, in order to support the livelihoods of smallholder producers. And the governments of lead producing countries um, putting into place policies that enable the expansion of palm oil. 
Um, all of these are legitimate obje objectives. There's nothing illegitimate about supporting the development of a national economy, about supporting the food security and livelihoods of um, farmers engaged in palm oil production, or indeed caring about health outcomes and environmental outcomes. They're all completely legitimate objectives, but they are not coherent with one another. So this example illustrates how challenging it is to try and balance these different outcomes that we want to see from food systems while recognizing that all of these objectives are largely legitimate. So policy co uh, in uh, incoherence becomes uh, not just a technical question, but a political question about um, what kind of priorities and outcomes we're gonna prioritize in the policy decisions that are made. Uh, so it should be seen as a, a political issue as well as a um, as well as a, a technical um, issue. And it comes really back to the heart of what we talk about when we talk about a systems approach, um, how to achieve um, multiple outcomes, um, better outcomes on, on multiple fronts in balance across um, across food systems. It's really at the heart of it, this, this issue of, um, of, of incoherence. But it's not just a simple question of saying, well, this policy is incoherent with another. There might not even be a policy in place. For example, when we look at uh, incoherences in, in trade policy, we know that um, in, in, um, the, the nature of investment and trade uh, policies, the policies that govern trade liberalization have enabled uh, an environment in low middle income countries that's uh, facilitated investment by companies that are producing foods that should be produced, it uh, should be consumed in moderation. And the effect of that has to be to excite the competitive nature of the, di of the market dynamics, which encourages uh, promotion and consumption of these um, uh, sometimes called, often called ultra processed foods. Um, but there, is, there might not be in, in, in any, pl any policy in place in that country, which tries to reduce the intake of those foods. So it's not actually a policy going to incoherence, it's just an incoherence in the system. Um, but of course, if you were to put a policy into place, it would lead to a, a politically challenging, uh, challenging situation. Uh, you may also have a situation where you put a policy into place uh, and it may be incoherent on paper, but in practice, the outcome of the policy is different to what is written on paper. So where does the incoherence exist? Uh, in other words, uh, policy co incoher incoherence and, 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 and narrations of the policy in, in incoherence is not at all straightforward. Um, and therefore we need to interrogate it um, in an in-depth way to really explore whether this is something in our policy, in our toolbox that we should be using uh, in order to advance better outcomes in agri-food systems on multiple fronts and what role it has um, in, in delivering um, systemic uh, change that we are all um, seeking. So it is a, a complex area, um, and that's why we are so delighted to be engaged in a learning process uh, with uh, University College uh, London um, on to trying to understand uh, the concepts and the practice uh, much better. Um, and um, over, over the past uh, two or three months, uh, we've had four master students, uh, two of whom are here, unfortunately, two weren't able to attend owing to, to visa issues, but um, who, who've been really scouring the literature on this topic to try and help us better understand it. And this uh, literature review enabled um, our, uh, the students to design an interview protocol and survey, which they administered in Uganda, South Africa and Ireland. So we're going to hear the results of these research efforts, uh, which has been overseen um, by my colleague Eleanor, who'll be moderating the next uh, session. Um, and we're also delighted to have with us two representatives from two of those countries, uh, Dr. Peter Jacobs, Human Science from the Human Sciences Research Council in South Africa, and uh, Mr. Tom Arnold, who was chair of Ireland's agri Food Strategy Committee from 2019 to 2021, and currently ambassador for the Food Safety Authority of Ireland. And of course, we're also, as uh, Siobhan mentioned, honoured to have with us, uh, to have back with us, Professor Raina Cattell, um, who will, as Siobhan said, start with um, a guest lecture on systems approach for policy making. So at, at FAO, we are really committed to exploring, interrogating, and putting into practice 
the most effective tools that we have in order to achieve the vision of food systems as set out by um, our FAO strategic framework, as well as the, the UN uh, in the vision of uh, agri-food systems delivering on the SDGs. And um, as part of that, we really must better understand uh, policy co in co coherence and incoherence. So over to you um, for your uh, introductory uh, remark, for your... Um, I'm, I'm not used to speaking in these very formal uh, spaces. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Corinne and Siobhan, uh, uh, for these um, wonderful introductions. And yeah, it's it's a really great pleasure to be back here in in Rome and in FAO and. And I'm really delighted to have some of our students with us, and um, and it's such a an example of how we at um, at UCL and IAPP would like to collaborate with uh, public policy organizations to to have this uh, deeper, longer engagements that are both academic, both around teaching uh, policy um, uh, discussions, but then also include our students in in that process. So this is something that. Um, we are um, we are very proud to to showcase almost today as an as an as a perfect example of uh, of how to from our perspective at least. So I will um, talk briefly. Hopefully, um, being an academic, this is always a, a somewhat of a a challenge. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. And my my task here today, um, I think, is in, in in very much is sort of providing a bit of a broader context when we talk about policy coherence and incoherence. And I think that. The example of Palomo is such a beautiful example of, uh, of where all of those things come together. But then the question we, we have to ask is, well, what do we do then next? And this is where these ideas of uh, what we call like trans transformative or mission-oriented policies actually come in, because these policy frameworks, these new policy frameworks are very often used today, in indeed, for that very purpose to actually provide a, a way to actually understand where do we go next? If, if you now understand those, all those sort of systematic trade-offs, problems, challenges, political challenges, incoherent issues, where do we go next and how do we actually design our sort of next steps? And this is where I think the, the new transformative policy frameworks are, are helpful, hopefully, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that and I'll, I'll bring some examples, examples from agri-food systems as well. And I think that on the other hand, of course, if you have policy frameworks, you also need to have a public sector capabilities to actually to, to deliver on them, to design a, a sort of a new generation of policies and to have the analytical capabilities, to have the coordination, all of those capabilities. And then the students will, after the break, uh, dive, dive into the issue of coherence. And hopefully um, I will um, provide some of the introduction so that the students don't have to spend time on all of the, all of those issues and and in in uh, in contrast to the students i won't be marked so i can i can be i can be as relaxed and as as incoherent as i <laughs> as i as i can but they uh, yeah so they have a great audience to be to be marked anyway so it's just a oh the clicker it's always there oh yeah so just a very very quickly by institute of innovation and public purpose for those of uh, you in the room or online who haven't um, met us before we are at university college london we are a an academic department and we're very much focused on, on bringing together essentially a multidisciplinary set of scholars to to really think about uh, the idea of the state in the middle of that transformation of uh, social technical systems and we think that uh, the idea of the state in many ways needs to be reimagined to be more in, in many ways more dynamic but also focused on on partnerships with other uh, sectors around the government and really to be the not just sort of the top down leader in societies but actually a a strong partner for change and and in many ways we think economics and economic um, ideas have a lot to do with that so this is a symbiotic relationship between uh, government and economy or economics is what we are really uh, all about and as, as i mentioned already we are very keen on what on something we call practice-based theorizing and here is an fao and our collaboration is perfect example of that we are thinking you know theories of course matter a great deal but at the same time of course they need to be tested in practice as well so that's why we are very keen on collaborating and actually 
uh, ho hopefully helping to devise new approaches and test them in practice because something might really sound nice in a peer-reviewed uh, paper but if you don't test it in practice you don't know what it's about and hence also the, the idea of having our students being involved in this process is, is something that we are very keen on so now when we when we look at this idea of uh, of systems change and uh, and, and uh, systems um, uh, approaches to policy a lot of that has to do with this idea that we have not just sort of sectors anymore that we don't have individual energies uh, sector or or of even a food sector as such but uh, but food as you mentioned in the case of palm oil has such a implications towards health and all of those other areas as well so we're looking at what we call grand challenges and of course that's where this sort of the idea of sdgs has become quite helpful and it, and this is sort of the broader context to understand why we look at uh, sort of the system transformation. So we are not transforming systems just for the sake of that or the sake of um, more economic growth, but actually we're trying to use very often systems ch uh, change to tackle some of those challenges. And, and some of the things that, um, that over the last 20 years, perhaps, has been really strong change in systems thinking here and, and also in, in a broader sort of policy landscape is sort of this understanding that innovation that is very often the driver of those changes through technological innovations but also social institutional innovations is actually a very often a a political process as you mentioned in the case of palm oil we have to figure out which direction we take actually palm oil and then and who actually then decides those directions who is engaged in those processes and i think this is where a lot of the existing policy frameworks have been sort of opening up because we realize that this is not just a a sort of like a cost benefit analysis but it's a very much a political process who among us is actually then engaged and how and why and hence of course why for us the idea of a government or a state is such an important not only because the government can take the lead in that sense but also the way governments engage with societal actors in these processes and again how do we then decide which direction we go is is is, is so important and hence um, another sort of like a challenge and here is an example from UK but I think most governments have a similar sort of issues is that we actually very rarely know how many of our policies are actually working and hence I think Corinna you mentioned as well whether we know is there is a coherence or incoherence is something that is very often we have very little sense and here's an um, sort of like an official study from from UK that argues that in 80 percent of government big projects nobody really knows whether they are working or not so we just keep them going and we keep them picking over and a lot a lot of that has to do with the way we learn in government we usually run you know large-scale evaluation processes they take years to to carry out and then we have results and by but by that time people who designed those policies or have implemented them have usually moved on so again, we we kind of started a new, and I think this is a very very big challenge. So so you have these two challenges, if you will. One is that yes, we want to use sort of policy to tackle the current challenges, SDGs, uh, and and sort of the direct innovation and all those efforts. But at the same time, we very rarely know what actually works in government. So we have this, if, even if you have this normative goal, yes, we want to tackle the challenges, but actually how to do that is the real. A real real challenge and i think here we're sort of this idea of systems and grand challenges are really we have to see them as twins in many ways yes systems analysis is a it's a very good and powerful tool of understanding the interlinkages and all of those things but actually if you don't know what are you trying to tackle what kind of challenges you're trying to tackle it just becomes very often a, a nice exercise in understanding the problems that there there is an, an in u.s policy making there is a wonderful phrase that that policymakers are very often very good at admiring the problem. We are, you know, we're looking at from this side and this side, and we're engaging it. And systems analysis has also a danger to be this enormous maps of systems. But you know, where do we enter that? And hence this idea that we can actually use the challenges to guide our direction. But this is, of course, easier said than done. And I use this example in in our our uh, work in Rwanda, where you know, because. Um, you know, Rwanda is famous for its tea and coffee, and you can ask, you know, we, we should really, in a way, we are looking at how should this, you know, cup of tea is, is produced, and who's involved, and who's gaining, and, and how sustainable that is, and all of those things can be sort of summed up around one cup of tea, in a way, but of course, this sort of the system of, of around that is, is something that we have to really, really focus on, and this is where 
I've used this uh, before that the work uh, from uh, innovation agents in Sweden, when they use the same idea of, uh, of looking at a like essentially cup of tea. So if you want to have a, we will have a coffee break here as well. So if you want to make that coffee or cup of tea sustainable here in Rome or in, in, in Rwanda or wherever, you actually have to bring all of that system into, into play. And that's why I think in many ways, I think as, as Karina mentioned as well, sort of the idea of looking at systems and challenges, they both actually um, sort of express the need for policymakers to look for coordination, to understand which elements of that system and how do we coordinate? If you look at here, you start from energy to waste management. All of that has to do with us having a sustainable cup of tea. And so how do we get there becomes a huge challenge, of course. But also it, it, it shows why do we need to actually have so much focus on learning because if you don't understand elements of the system and how our interventions from policymaking are changing some of those elements in the system, and if you only do those long-term evaluation after every three or five years and look at only maybe at the project level, maybe not at a bigger picture level, we are not actually not really learning. And so we are sort of in this continuous cycle of trying to fix things, uh, having new, new levels on, and policies and new policy ideas, but actually not really being able to affect much change. And, there is another a, a wonderful book by uh, Jennifer Polka, which is called Recoding America, and she calls it a policy vomit, that we are vomiting new policies all the time because we are not able to really, you know, le learn on the ground around those systems. And then we see this is, you know, cup of tea and behind cup of tea, there is such a complex system. It requires at least 500, 500 pages of policy, right? Capture all of that. And also there's, I think, when we go into coherence and coordination, we think we have to, you know, Get, get everybody in the room, we have to sort of, everybody has to be on, everything has to be, uh, you know, perfectly sort of aligned. And I think this is where, where the challenge really is. How do we actually move these kind of very complex systems? But of course, as you, as you mentioned around palm oil, it also brings forth the competing uh, values and value systems in many ways. And I think this has particular, particular importance for, for lower middle income countries where you know, even like land ownership issues and things like that play a huge role in terms of the power of incumbents. Uh, and of course, you have also the power of uh, multinational companies and all of those that, that actually make all of this um, um, much more challenging. And hence, I think, and just to briefly sort of um, this idea of challenges, I think there's very often the, also the mis misunderstanding of them that these are very sort of like a, that, that they should be top down direction. This is what we have to do. And there's a wonderful work by by Andy Sterling uh, from uh, University of Sussex, looking at that the directionality is actually just sort of a much wider set of ideas around normatively, how do we actually shift some of those uh, systems? So here's an example of uh, net, um, net carbon energy. Doesn't mean that everybody has to build nuclear power plants, for instance. There's lots and lots of choices you can make, and these choices are political and, and are contextual. So even if you have a, a as you, you, you think about, uh, you know, transforming all the food systems, it probably takes quite a different um, a set of policies, actors in different settings. So designing templates is something that uh, we, may, we may want to do, but actually we, we may need to be cautioned here. And now when, when we come to this idea of <clears throat> like transformative policy, and that's, that's the sort of the frameworks have become more and more relevant and now there is an even um com compared to a year ago when we started our process at uh, with the fao i think there's much more uh, emphasis on this idea that we need <clears throat> excuse me to have stronger more transformative more engaged policy making if you will and you know there's some there's really a focus on what we can call this new resilience in a way that um, has to do with both uh, overlapping crises of um of inflation geopolitical um, issues and so on and so forth and that has become really the driver of sort of like a new industrial policy if you will but there is also very much a normative thinking or normative turn in science technology innovation policies education policies again to understand them as a, as a set of like a, a a policies that are not just there to have uh, increased um, you know number of publications or increased um, uh, phds or whatever but actually what are those students and um, what are those research grants actually doing? I think in this context, also the mission oriented policies, and I will come to that in, in a second, offer a, a sort of a form of these kind of uh, transformative policy frameworks. 
and I think also we see a lot of uh, <clears throat> also very small scale sort of um, you know every country every city has policy labs there are all these smaller units sandboxes there's a lot of in a way bottom-up at attempts to do this transformation not as a big uh, planned policy process but also a much more experimental process as well so we see a lot of activity around these frameworks and I think what is really important, I think, that systems thinking and systems analysis offers in many ways to say a sort of the tools for, for almost all of those um, uh, policy frameworks. But I think importantly also, there is lots around new economic thinking or um, from very quantitative complexity economics, for instance, to much more qualitative economics that uh, looks at, for instance, decolonizing aspects of, of economic uh, policies and economics as such. and. And so there's a, 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 a wide range of thinking that is sort of merging around systems and, and, and economics, if you will. And I wanted to just to use in missions, of course, because uh, our director, Mariana Mazzucato, has been, has been really the, the key driver behind this idea of mission-oriented policy frameworks. And here's just a couple of examples of her, of her work. But I think what is really interesting is to sort of take, look at the criteria that she has uh, developed. and. And at the moment, if you look at around globally, since last 10 years, perhaps, um, I think we, we can now maybe count more than 200, perhaps even more missions, mission-oriented policy examples. They, some of them are very big, like European Union programs, or you know, you can argue some of the US uh, Biden administration policy programs around uh, energy transformations. And some of them are very small in, in cities and in towns. And, and so there's lots and lots of activity around that. But I think this idea that we need to provide a, a sort of like a directionality of change uh, with bold goals that we agree, and then actually at the same time keep in mind that this is not a big planning exercise, but this actually needs to develop this environment where there are multiple different um, approaches are being tested and used to achieve these goals, something that I think is is, is, is very interesting and, and valid. And I'll show a couple of examples from food, agri-food systems, how missions have been have been used but as you will see there's always a um uh, in particularly i find in agri-food systems uh, that sort of the systems transformation approaches are are very much complementary or used um in, in in there as well but before that i think there isn't something we have to sort of think about as well is that when we look at the missions and lower middle, middle income countries there's always um, very it's very easy to say if you go to a place like in a country in Africa or Latin America do they have the capabilities actually to to take on those transformational policies they all sound wonderful on paper can they actually do it <clears throat> I think there are definitely challenges if you think about uh uh, particularly even the innovation and, and policy systems and production systems are, are very asymmetrical in a typical <clears throat> lower mi middle income country so you, you don't have strong universities you don't have tr strong r d centers a lot of <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> you have actually multinational companies being very importantly present you don't have a um uh, small and medium enterprises a lot of the economy is informal even and all of those things and of course you can argue there is also low public sector capabilities which is also true at the same time i think what we see why missions are also so attractive in um, in in this kind of um settings is because they essentially represent this idea of, of of going back to the idea of developmental state um that was in many cases a very successful a way of understanding development, having these ambitious developmental goals, aligning a lot of policy activities and organizations around those goals, and actually also being um, very, very good at understanding um, and learning how do we, are, are we actually getting closer to those goals or not. So I think missions represent in, in, in lower and middle income country context to sort of return to developmentalist ideas and, and stronger sort of engagement of, of the state in general. And I think there's also this uh, uh, understanding, particularly UN sister organization, UNIDO, has been doing really interesting work around how you can understand structural change industrialization through SDGs. So it doesn't have to be only about exports, but it's actually SDG kind driven export or okay. SDG aligned export, if you will, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, issues around from diversity to environment can be part of industrialization uh, uh, strategies. And I think this is a very useful way as well. So I think missions and these kind of uh, uh, policy frameworks actually can play a very useful role in lower middle income country context as well. 
And there is some research around mission oriented agricultural systems as well. I, we, um, I didn't realize we are all sitting so far from the slides, but but you can um, um, there's um, interesting research trying to apply this in the in the context of uh, of um, agricultural uh, and agri food systems. And here is just an article from a couple of years ago, and um, and we don't need to go into that detail, but there is an at least a, an attempt to do that on an academic level as well. In terms of uh, examples, I wanted to use Sweden here as an example. I, you know, realizing of course Sweden is an is a highly developed uh, country, but what is interesting here is, is you see this sort of a a mixture of on the left hand side you see their mission that you they want that every student in Sweden eats sustainable and tasty food, uh, and in Sweden is a country that government is paying um, almost most of the lunches in schools, so there it's not about new funding, but on the on the on the right hand side you see their at, because schools are owned by municipalities, so they what they have designed is essentially a set of interventions for municipalities. And I think it's interesting on the right hand side to see that there's a they are supporting a development of prototypes. So they don't think that every school, every municipality will get to this uh, mission in the same way. They realize this might take a very different approach in different um, uh, parts of the country, even in the same town. So they have uh, sort of provided this kind of uh, ways of around different leverage points. And here you see sort of the mixing of transformative policy goals and, and systems thinking that we have understood where our sort of key leverage points in our systems are. And we design an, a, a policy actions around those leverage points without actually saying, Everybody has to find. Everybody has to use the same leverage point. Everybody has to, you know, start the systemic uh, sort of transformational processes from the same perspective. And I think this is, is is a very interesting and useful example of thinking how we need to have this overarching policy framework, but these frameworks actually need to be flexible. Because again, if you then have municipalities that choose different options here, different, combine different options, what you as a policymaker are able to do, you're able to learn. What actually works? What works better? What's, what works in, in what context? So you don't have this sort of an overarching big plan that everybody has to follow because that, you know, brings uh, demands for coordination, brings demands for coherence, all that. But you actually leave that flexibility uh, in that system. But of course, this, as you will see, requires also system, um, um, significant capabilities. Australia is, is, a, is, a, is a slightly different, more industry-focused um, food uh, mission. It's around future protein mission. So, but this is what they try to do is, is pretty much sort of mix up the existing sources of protein with the future pro uh, sources of protein as well. So it's bringing new actors, new sort of producers, new firms, and but also new technology and R and D into that system of, around protein. So it's very much a, a more vertical idea, but it's still trying to take a sort of transformation that, that we need to do and bring in new actors and, and new um, new ways of doing that as well. And the final one we used from Rwanda, which uh, which we uh, went and uh, had a, a wonderful uh, session uh, last November. And I know that Rwanda has been going on, on, its, on a journey afterwards uh, and in a very, very useful way, I think. But I think here you see that what they call game changers and you know whatever we call them game changers or missions or whatever we want to call them but again it's like we are finding these key areas as goals and then within those goals we look for this leverage points and i think they you know obviously in their context it's not about school food but it's about um uh, looking at other issues and, and uh, looking at farmers and because it's a country that is is, is in the middle of transitioning from an agricultural country into a society that where industry and services will play a big role as well. I think it's, a, again, I, I find it um, uh, the, the way they have devised this sort of a, um, idea of game changers is, 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 is really, really well done. And some of the really interesting lessons from, from Rwanda, I think, when we think about this sort of uh, systemic change and, and uh, transformation is that sort of the, the need to balance in a way what do we actually are transforming? What are the systems we are trying to transform as part of the larger agri-food system? And what what is, what is worth keeping? What is actually working relatively well? And what, where do we need to add? And this actually requires a, a strong set of capabilities to have a both sort of like an honest assessment. What do we want to keep and what do we want to change? And, and specifically, what is that we are actually transforming? And 
and because if you think in like a country like Rwanda, if you if you project into future 10, 15, 20 years, they will have many people moving from countryside to cities. So in a way, agri-food transformation is also transforming future city because you need to plan, you could plan for that as well, because that's, this requires public services, this is what requires all of that. And of course, of course, also this, are we thinking of transformation as this big waterfall event of having a big plan in place and then this is being sort of given to everybody to implement? Or are we thinking about it as a, as a more of an iterative learning journey and how do we actually design and, and who decides the pace of transformation as well and, and where are those decisions being made? Um, and of course, also that, you know, as I said, uh, this learn idea of learning is, is so important in transformation and, and because how do otherwise we have no sense of, of where we are and we don't really know whether we're actually getting there at all. I think sort of thinking that no policy is perfect to begin with. So, but how do we make sure that we actually have those elements of, of, uh, of, of learning in the policy and go away from, from perhaps sort of thinking that we can do that in a, in a few years times and then we value it and come back. And I think one of the challenges we face in, in all contexts or for transformational policies is what are the institutional innovations, new institutions and, and capabilities that we, that we need for this. And here's uh, sort of my last part of my, my presentation. I hopefully I'm in time and it's really around those sort of um, um, capabilities around transformation. Because in many ways, we see that when we look at transformational policies in agri-food systems in other ways, that there is this say, a sort of a lack of um, capabilities to, to, to implement them. It has a lot to do with framing. So, um, you know, which level of policies we are actually setting those transformational goals? Do they have to be on the national level? Do they have to be on the level of, 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 of systems? Do they have to be on the level of urban systems, cities, regions, um, and also that, you know, uh, systems are very often around engagement, but again, how do we actually build uh, engagement processes so that the legitimacy is still there, it doesn't become tokenistic, it becomes actually uh, giving uh, social partners some, some real power in that processes. There is also the experimentation can be really good, but actually how do we in, in make, make sure that we, we go from pilot to a actual program? There's all these kind of a, a, a sort of a, a questions around yes, developmental evaluation is really good and, and quick learning processes or agile learning processes sound really good, but how do we actually do that? How, what does it look like on actual policy practice when we have to deliver on our existing programs, when we have to uh, negotiate budgets on an annual basis? How do we actually get there? So all of these questions require quite a lot of specific capabilities to be developed for that transformational processes. And I think what we see a lot of governments, the sort of the, the mistake in a way they make is that they think we take existing institutions, existing capabilities, and we give them the task of system transformation without actually thinking that there's a lot of required within that capabilities to be upgraded, upskilled, and, and maybe even, even uh, learned as well. So again, I didn't realize we are sitting so far from the slides, but this is a, a, a trying to do a, a bit of a bit of an uh, introduction to the students' presentation later on as well. In a way that um, and this is a, a sort of combining some of the research around public administration and, and system transformation, policy coherence, where the, the sort of the more complex systems we are looking at, the more ambitious we are in a way in our transition tasks. Of course, the more challenging it, be, it becomes. And, and on the right-hand side, you see the an example from energy system transformation where at the lower left-hand side is, 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 is wind. So we, yes, wind energy, there's a need of specific um, sort of understanding around, and we can, we can, you know, we can do analysis, we can invest, fine. Then you go up, up a level, it's a renew renewable energies. It's a mix of energies. It already becomes more complicated because it becomes also a political economy issue, who's, who's involved, who's not involved. And then if you go into the energy system, of course, it becomes much more sort of a complicated. And of course, the, the need for sort of capabilities increasing as well. And on the left-hand side, there is a, a wonderful research about what's called transition tasks. When we think about the social technical systems, there's a loads of tasks in order to transform them. There's about, you know, setting the direction. Who is doing that? Who's setting the direction of that specific system that we're looking at? 
who is actually supporting that system uh, governance who because it's not only about one ministry or one department there's multiple uh, actors in uh, ministries involved who's actually supporting the new uh, when we talk about palm oil for instance who's supporting those actors that are doing something really new in that sector and who's de destabilizing the uns unsustainable who's destabilizing the unsustainable ways of producing uh, uh palm oil they were doing now and so on and so forth i think this all all, all actually new tasks in a way for every sort of civil servant in a way uh, who's sitting in a, a agricultural ministry or, or whatever these are a new sets of tasks they're not part of their 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 job and this is where uh, i have to also plug my own book of course um which we the book really looks at that historically how does this happen how do the organizations then or you know in, in many ways how does transformational change happen and, and the, the simple question is, do we need new institution or reform the existing ones? And I think that the, the historical research tells us that we need to do both. We need to actually low focus on the existing institutions to upskill them, to help them actually uh, become a part of the transformational process. But very often we also need some new elements. Either we need new within the existing institutions or we need uh, you know the uh, part of the ecosystem there needs to be units that are better at foresight for instance or more sort of strategic intelligence um, you know we very often see policy lab we we see things like sandboxes there's lots of testing and piloting going on and that is in a way is a sign but of course the challenge is are we able to make sure that these organizations then actually feed into the core big institutions existing ones and that's sort of them in a way if, if you will the institutional landscape and this is where i come to the to the end that where our research is really focuses is, is on sort of picking up these capacities and capabilities into different layers and 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 it's easy to say yes we need better capabilities better institutions but but if you sort of um, pick um try to sort of uh, delineate what are we talking about and, and we sort of propose to talk about on three 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 different layers and um, you know you have really but it's a it's a metaphor of a house in a way there is this sort of idea that you have a structural capacity which is very much around infrastructure for instance um or even then sort of the resources that a, a certain country has and also it's sort of economic specializations and all of these things that are very difficult to change that are typically we change in decades rather than one or two years but they play a very big role and of course this is where uh, developmental states uh, particularly in east asia were very very good at they were very good at providing this basic structural capacity for the society in in a way and then for the for the essentially for the private sector to to play its role they provided this context they provided the structural capacity and you could argue that a lot of lower middle income countries has a challenges around structural capacity for instance do they have actually existing more or less functioning civil service systems for instance in many cases this is not the case so it's a structural capacity that you as an agricultural ministry cannot really change you cannot change a civil service system because this is a given for you but then there are lots of like what we call organizational routines that the way you do procurement for instance the, the way you coordinate policies the way you um, practice evaluation these are things that organizations practice day in and day out and these are things that you can change but you can't change them again not from one one day to, on, to another or within few months it takes a couple of years to to learn and to do them differently and of course then what we call on top of that is are those what we call dynamic capabilities or these are really those skills and competencies of public organizations and, and individuals are, are really around adapting and, and redirecting your existing routines and resources are you able to actually take your budgets and take something from that from new initiatives are you able to to reconfigure a procurement processes do you have the capabilities to do that and this is when we when we think about them um, and the students will talk about that uh, later in their presentation as well we think that there are at least um, the, particularly also for when you talk about transformational policies and i think this is also relevant for the for the food systems you have this sort of five sets of capabilities that when we are looking at country a, a country a in, in in latin america in country b in, in, in africa can we support them in sense making you know system awareness how do we actually support in, in agri-food systems what are the analytical skills needed for these kind of system awareness how, can we build essentially templates from countries to develop those can we look at policy coordination how this is done um 
uh, can we actually build build those skills can we what we call seizing in a way can you actually if you if you have a good idea in terms of policy can you action it as a learning uh, process you know in, in a sense that can we test your idea first before we actually plan it for five years can we do a small test can we see it actually does it work are we actually able to do that and shaping in a way can we actually take our existing sort of budgets and people and routines and sort of to redirect them towards these new initiatives and of course diffusing and uh, well if you have in, in organization a unit something really work can this be actually diffused across the organization can we develop competency frameworks training programs so all of these kind of things and we think that you can sort of to assess and evaluate these things in, in countries and organizations and essentially develop um, training programs as we have done with the FAO collaboration so far our idea is again the slides are way too small and or my classes are weak I don't know but, um, <laughs> but probably both <laughs> but uh, so what we have thought with uh, with Shavon and her team is to develop those kind of training modules that we can then use uh, and an FAO can use in different country settings looking at uh, sort of the systems thinking basics and looking at the new policy frameworks examples across the countries but then also look at the capabilities and how can we actually uh, develop them in, in different uh, settings as well I think I took way too much time but thank you very much for for your attention Thank you very much, Reiner, for that very, very stimulating, very stimulating indeed um, uh, presentation, which I have to say aligns um, and, and really adds shape and structure um, to many of the reflections that we've been having in the, the division, um, particularly around uh, learning processes. Um, the establishment of the Systems Change Learning Programme, of which this, uh, uh, this, this um, partnership is is part of uh, is the as a new program in the in the division um which is really thinking about uh, transformations in the way that we learn and you, and you mentioned a couple of those about um the experimentation due to inherent uncertainty in the system um as well as organizational learning and we're focusing on both of those as part of the systems change um learning uh, program of which this as i said this partnership is a is a part um, but what's interesting, and, and what, what I find quite interesting as an observation, is one, there isn't really a willingness, and obviously in a lower middle income country context, this is even more important, but donors and those who are financing, they just want to kind of finance action, like you yeah. know, getting things done, like, you know, what are you going to achieve, where's your log frame, what are you going to achieve, how are you going to achieve it, go and get it done, right. rather than the capabilities, the learning capabilities, the recognition of uncertainty. This is a very hard um, right. ask. And of course, politically, when we see the rise of, of populism in various parts of the world, where promises are just made, like, you know, we yeah. promise this, we're going to do it. And of course, as they get into, into power, then, then they have to do other things in order to manage the fact that they're not actually achieving those things. Right. Um, so a, a lot of challenges. And I think this is why we've tried to take yeah. on this, because it's precisely because it's difficult. Um, and um, if we're not willing to take on difficult things that push us out of our comfort zone, then what are we here for? <laughs> so I applaud the fact that uh, you're bringing us the structure and shape that we need in order to organize our, our thoughts. It's, it's really very stimulating indeed. And there'll be an opportunity for uh, questions and answers later. But let me hand over to uh, Siobhan, who's going to provide the context um, for what one has presented in the, in the context Sorry. of the um, um of the um on on the on the training topics um in in particular so over to you where you're supposed to be first <laughs> yeah okay. no problem it's just because you're such a hard act to follow rainer so that no, no, was no, no, not no. the intention to come I... after you <laughs> but but nonetheless nonetheless i think <laughs> yeah in order to um yet yeah, contextualize um the um the the, uh, the the work that FAO is doing on policy making and agri food systems transformation, and I think we can already see, uh, as you inferred, Corinna, this convergence of um, competencies you know, between uh, FAO's uh, expertise in the agri food the agri food sector in in all its dimensions and then the expertise that uh, IIPP brings in terms of systems tools systems 
um, thinking and what that means for public sector institutions. Um, so, yeah, to give that that context from the uh, FAO side. Um, so, yeah, this this inference of these these wicked or grand challenges. So we're all aware of them, I'm not going to labor them, climate change, um, malnutrition, obesity and so forth. And they're all not new, but they are persistent and uh, they require a sense of urgency. And with that, then we had the UN Food System Summit and it adopted uh, advocated for the adoption of this systems approach and that really elevated uh, at a global level the concept of a systems approach to um, address these these wicked or, or grand challenges you know, as they're known in the literature um, and uh, uh, the um, the the output from one of the important outputs from the um, the UN Food System Summit were these national pathways where countries were invited to develop uh, these um, systems uh, visions, you know, that brought together the different grand challenges um, and uh, the prioritization and those in that sense. Uh, but then moving on, it's the implementation of those because governments are organized, obviously, according to line ministry sectoral, uh, this concept of agri-food system then for them is, is elusive and it's an abstract concept. And so uh, the work that um, IIPP and all the thinking around that uh, then helps us kind of converse and uh, gives us language to address this elusiveness and, and abstract uh, concept. Um, and uh, yeah, it helps us to translate basically the concept of agri-food systems into more practical tools um, that governments can can implement um, and but but also from the FAO um, stance I think it's important to understand that we're building off decades of institutional learning from different entry points related to the the agri-food system, plant and production, agribusiness, um, food security, nutrition. Um, but there I would also say that it's the, the more um, systems type approaches as well that the organization has also been behind. Um, I, I remember when I started here in, in FAO, I won't say many years ago, but um, there was a lot of talk about farm systems. So really this concept of moving the thinking outside of production outside of increasing yields and then i was involved in livelihoods you know the concept of uh, think moving the thinking moving the policies beyond the farm and into how uh, the implication of uh, agriculture production food security for livelihoods beyond and 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 the nexus there and then more recently we had value chains and this more kind of thinking moving policies beyond the farm up to uh, retail consumer and everything in between and i think that the, all of those approaches then have compounded and in a sense led us to um and contributed to in the agri-food sector anyway uh, this this no this uh, realization uh, that we need to be thinking in a much um in a much uh, broader space um and then to say that uh, as well that this work on better policy making for agri-food systems falls under the learning program that that Karina um referred to and um it also, uh, w under that program as well, we have food losses and waste, uh, we have standards and sustainability, and we have food value chain development. So using that program, as you're saying, uh, Corinna, to really kind of nurture and leverage all of that learning and yeah, understand how to structure it and organize it so that we can make a contribution to improving those capabilities um, for the public sector. Um, so what we found in uh, moving the, the 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 learning from this the traditional policy making to agri food systems policy making and in response to policymakers ask to us about what's the value add in a sense what's the value add from the systems of the systems for the work that we do in um, in ministries uh, at the national level and 
the response is that it's it's recognizing you know, the interrelationships across the different parts of of the system and it provides an avenue for this interministerial and intersectoral um nature that that the systems approach brings that it provides that space for the collaboration and interdisciplinary approach and that it's an iterative process and um uh, very importantly this um a convergence as well between the role that innovation plays in all of of that too um so and an important um conversation as well that we also have our countries is that you're not starting from ground zero that and this was actually a point that Preeti uh, my colleague was saying yesterday in our meeting that we also need to be careful that we're not um confusing or overwhelming as well policymakers and that they there isn't the 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 message that this is new it's a lot of countries are already doing this and have been doing it in terms of how they're they're managing their policies and translating them into action on the ground and food safety and nutrition public food procurement urban food policy support to smes agri uh, agri food tourism um uh, one health you know these are all uh, programs that governments um have taken charge of and are uh, designing and implementing in in a systems way and so i think that the systems approach and the conversation around this is just really kind of putting it to the fore and making a more concerted effort in that respect so um yeah we've uh, the the uh, the collaboration with iopp i cannot yeah um uh yeah to speak you know it's it's been such an excellent learning process for um for the team and um the exposure you know to all of the different tools that i think are being implemented with maybe countries that we don't normally work with and also sectors so i think what it, also this work that iapp uh, is bringing and these new lessons are also coming in from different sectors that FAO wouldn't typically on our daily basis have exposure to and I think that cross uh yeah sectoral outside of the agri-food system is is also important um so this is an overview of the modules um that uh, were developed over the past um year um and the 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 work that we did in rwanda i really think is is a great example because when we it was great timing when we landed in rwanda the the uh, agri food system strategy the country had committed in theory to um a systems approach but we're still obviously struggling struggling with that what that meant for for um as as many countries do and um i after the engagement with uh, Rwanda, uh, we saw kind of a, a transformation in the uh, draft policies that the draft um, strategy that was coming through. It was, um, you know, the, the drafts were being iterated. And after the the um, after the training and after this engagement and more language coming in in terms of governance capabilities, uh, coordination, and uh, really uh, a a convergence between the technical issues that the country is facing across the agri food system and um, how these systems capabilities. Um, can uh, translate this um, strategy into something that's more livable, that it's um, agile, and that uh, it's providing the space for it to change as the system itself changes. Uh, yeah, apologies again for the small. Uh, yeah, so just plugging here as well our uh, products that we've been doing on on policy making. So. Uh, policy briefs with countries there uh, taking this notion that yeah Br Preeti brought up yesterday in terms of um putting what countries are already doing in terms of policies in terms of multi-stakeholder collaboration um or you know documenting it in a system structure and um, um emphasizing this fact that uh countries there are a number of countries that are already de facto doing this um and then multi-stakeholder engagement is a super important area of work for us as well we have this guide with UNEP and UNDP 
and um, we're building the learnings and the tools that were developed in that also into the training that we've developed with IRPP. Uh, also, the SFS Med platform that's led by my colleague uh, Jose Valls, uh, very much there at a regional level, looking at policy, multi-stakeholder dialogues and platforms, um, and uh, really a great source of, of learning um, at, um, at that regional focus uh, level. So the way forward in terms of the collaboration with IAPP, so we're doing a training of trainers with policymakers. Um, and uh, at a global level, policymakers for our policy uh, experts um, from FAO policy officers from FAO in November here in, in Rome. Um, then we'll uh, follow that up as well with a peer to peer country exchange where we'll bring lead countries together with lag countries, countries that are trying to catch up, trying to um, uh, learn. From, from other peer countries in terms of how this uh, systems approach can be applied to their country context and then um, instilling as well and uh, the learning from, from the training in, in that meeting. Um, also an important aspect that, that we need to do more on is engaging with tertiary body, bodies in each of the regions so that uh, this learning is um, embedded into local institutional uh, education sectors, uh, leveraging the learning program as well, and um, on particularly on monitoring and evaluation, like how how this lands at the country level, what we, can we learn, and then how we can reiterate the process and, and improve on it. And um, yeah, continuing this a concept of, of co-creation and using events like the uh, the stock take, the UN FSS stock take, using our collaboration with the African Union, NAPAD, the Post Malibu um, declaration is is going is currently under negotiation using that, using the issue-based coalition in the Europe and Asia region. So um, yeah, that's just to give a context in terms of how this lands with the uh, the FAO and the work that we do with um, with countries. Back to you, Corinna. Thank you, Ron, for providing that very clear overview of, of where all of this fits together. It's very exciting work. Um, really delighted uh, to have you. Uh, lead on this, uh, Siobhan, with your your team and and really uh, pushing forward this uh, this approach, which is so important to our to our work um, as a whole. So we have some time for questions, um, both for Rhina and for Siobhan as well. Um, so we'd be happy to to engage in a bit of discussion here, uh, should there be uh, questions. There's also about 40 people online, there may. Yeah, very welcome to the people online. I was trying to work out where they were um because i can't see them uh, but i did notice that there was participants on online um, but i don't know how we can see if they've got their hands raised um if anyone can help with that then uh then let me know um okay so nicole um um and then uh, Pamisha, you had your no and then paul also had a question yes Please Thank you so ahead. much. Fantastic conversation. I'm so glad I'm here. Uh, I'm Nicole Dipala, working for the UN Food Systems Coordination Hub. I may have many comments, but try to be brief. Uh, on I think this point of uh, creating the capacity is so important, and that takes time and resources. And so a little bit, if I could hear, maybe from, from the perspective of FIO and also uh, from uh, the lecture previously on how much of the sensitization maybe perhaps we need to with donors and things, because I think we have these great ideas that they always look amazing on paper and in practice it's very hard to implement, especially uh, with the timing that we have on this issue of results, Karina, that you mentioned. Uh, I am working uh, right now on this capacity building, uh, well, for better, lack of a better expression, uh, with the youth, so trying to be strategic and applying the systems thinking approach already at the uh, you know an early stage, but it's very hard to have a continuation on that. So, a second question clearly: uh, How do we see that in terms of the science policy? Also, you know, having um, if you have any comments, how do we on the co-creation? Sometimes when we talk about science policies, usually also the scientists have the answers, and we try to transfer that to policymakers, right? And we see that. The co-creation part is usually very hard to implement. So I don't know if you have any insights uh, on that. Thank you very much. 
we'll take a couple of other questions and then and then come back to you. Uh, Paul, I think you were next. Super, and thank you very much. Um, so great to be involved in uh, this stage and see it continuing. Um, I have a couple of uh, observations. I, I like this idea at the very beginning of innovation is political, and, and that made me think then, uh, what is the lack of innovation? And maybe that's cultural, because I'm wondering myself, why do I continue to kind of uh, farm beef in Ireland? It's definitely not commercial. It's not political, because there's not much support in terms of that, but it's very, very deeply rooted in cultural. I think that 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 builds into that conversation of innovation and why innovation isn't happening and, and broadens it out. And I know political is inherently related to cultural and uh, commercial, um, but it is a very valid point. I think when we look at systems and changing or shifting, nudging systems, whatever you want to say. On the cup of tea example, again, really, really like this, but I'm wondering then, chipping away the values and interests part are we trying are, are are we understanding this to mean that there is essentially one sustainable way of producing that cup of tea or is it a, a range um within which is sustainable or is it essentially an evolving kind of state of sustainability and i think this is the interesting part when you have a conversation about for example for me it's producing beef the understandable uh, how we understand sustainability is very much rooted in the angle at which you're looking at the system so who you are in that system and i think this starts to become really interesting when you think the system is the same and maybe there's a range there but the perspective at which you're looking at it from really influences your understanding of where you want to go with that system uh the, the 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 combination of approaches then started to come through so the systems approach i think you know super exciting really good see the value of bringing it in but also see some of the challenges so coming from my background of working with the department of agriculture i'm thinking then is it a phased approach to start integrating this and then a combination so some and and is there a role for some of the more rigid longer term uh, foresight kind of policy approaches to complement this more dynamic shorter term systems approach and how that might work. Uh, two very quick points, flexibility, kind of a narrow to complexity and then a narrow to operation. And I'm wondering then, can we make it with flexibility? I know it's really good to kind of have a nice, flexible, open approach, but can it become too complex, too flexible to actually operationalize? And then is that predicated on the sense that the people that are responsible for doing the work, understand the system. They can manage that complexity, manage that flexibility. And I think this is an issue. The last point I wanna make is on this issue of donors. And um, so I think uh, Ireland has been a strong supporter all the way through. Uh, I think I'm very proud of the fact that we've stuck with it. I think that there will be, and there is a lot more interest out there. And I think what's happening is Ireland's further down the road in this policy coherence and systems approach and that's why funding makes more sense to us and i think as more donors get down the road and start experiencing firsthand the challenges that opens the door to the funding so thanks very much excellent presentations over thanks very much uh, there's a <laughs> there's a lot there but i will uh, just take two more from inside the room and then and pass back um Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Raina. This was really a very interesting and stimulating presentation. My name is Sven Helms. I'm working from the uh, UN Food System Hub. And we are <clears throat> working directly with governments and the national conveners, who are those uh, champions who have appointed to lead the food system journey, if you want, at country level. So many of the points you have uh, raised here are very much echoing what we hear from uh, our national conveners. Um, the challenge of promoting and uh, enabling a system approach across ministries. They are often referring to their Minister of Agriculture, or they could be sitting in the Ministry of Health or Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They have one reporting line. How do they exercise that system approach within the ministerial setup? That's a big, big question. And secondly, the question around the trade-offs, obviously. Um, how do we deal with trades off between production, food uh, self-sufficiency, um, for example, and nutrition or environment and so forth. Um, but I, I liked also very much your point that policymakers are very good at admiring the problems. And I think what we all are very interested in is going from policymakers to policy uh, enablers or practitioners. And, and how do we do this? Um, you mentioned that uh, a system 
approach system thinking um, and in particular on food systems is obviously a very political matter. So I think that the political leadership, the political guidance, um, what do we know? What do we have of good examples at country level that can be replicated and scaled up? And we do see some very interesting cases uh, with some of the countries we are working at. Uh, we have in Egypt a rotating leadership of the food system governance um, committee. So not only is it led by one ministry, but it's actually led by one year a Ministry of Agriculture, the next year you have Ministry of Environment, and the third year you have Ministry of Health. And that's really very interesting because, you know, that's one institutional way to try to build a broader ownership and leadership around food systems. So these kind of innovations from the ground, and I think around political leadership is critically important. Uh, we have uh, another very interesting case in Somalia, where they have set up a, a, a governance uh, platform for food systems, which is not only um, um, addressing food system, but also environment, climate and nutrition. So it has a broader set of, of responsibility, if you want. Um, my question, which is, it's a question that we often get from, from some of our conveners, is really a public administration question, if you want. So how do we incentivize best? What kind of examples do we have to incentivize this multi um, or interministerial, uh, multi-sectoral approach? Um, we... What do we have in, in, in addition to uh, incentives, uh, joint projects, uh, policy labs, foresight units? Uh, what about shared office, uh, shared uh, personnel, um, shared equipment? I mean, the fact that you have a printer in a, in a shared room brings a lot of people together. Uh, but what do we have? Do we have any good examples uh, at country level that we can we can look at? Um, so that that's just a very concrete question coming from from our national conveners. But thanks a lot again for a really inspiring um, presentation. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Fante. Please. Thank you very much for this presentation. Good morning. My name is Luisa Cruz. Uh, I work for the Development Law Service, the Legal Office in FAO. And I'm also supporting the development of Food Systems Integrated Program uh, funded by the Jeff. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested uh, for the um, sort of statement, but the presentation, the slide on, we know policies do not work, or we do not know if policies work or not. I think this is a major issue. And um, in, the, in the legal office, we have been, of course, kind of, thinking a lot of the need, of course, to um, strengthen very much the tools for assessing also the legislation and regulatory uh, instruments as part of these uh, very important um, issue to be, to be strengthened. But more generally, my, my question to you is uh, any sort of uh, <laughs> uh, interesting observations on that regard and also for FAO more generally, the issue of how to assess um, policies, the impact of policies, whether they are meeting or not the, the goals. It is also a political issue, and this becomes very closely tied to political interests of governments that maybe do not want to show that their policies are actually perhaps not working. So while we, we often see the, for instance, for regulatory impact assessment, we very often see that they are more implemented in terms of the ex ante impact assessments for assessing policies and particularly laws. It's more difficult to assess the ex post because there is also political cost behind. So I'm also kind of interested in these sort of more uh, policy, uh, political elements behind assessing the impact of are we actually what we're doing? Is it working or not? And I think this is something that as FAO, we should be really working on. Thank you so much.
ask you to try and organize the multiple points that were made in the factors anyway, and we can continue yeah. to reflect on them, but if I can ask you to, yeah, to, to focus uh, so um, yeah, we can manage the time. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely, and uh, I'm sure I, I was uh, I was at fault at, at getting us over time. So, I'll, I'll be I'll be very quick. I think they are all ex excellent questions, and and um, you know, maybe starting from from you, Lisa, about uh, learning. Of I, I think the, um, we in public policy we are sort of fundamentally look at learning from the wrong perspective. I think we are we are always we look at it from the perspective of impact rather than let's say failure because i think in a, in a way if you if you think about yourselves how do we learn we learn from making a mistake you know because nobody's ever perfect the first time around so i think we haven't really cracked the way of how do we have a a ministry or an agency operating where it's fine if something doesn't work so how do you set up so if you if you start to think from that perspective you probably actually think of, of your collection of inter interventions more of a, like a portfolio here, like five things we do, we and, and it's fine if not all of them work. But we have to set, you know, we have to start from that perspective. But as you say, governments very often operate in log frames and things like that, and precisely and toners as well, of course. And that's where the problem is. And I realize this is difficult, but you know, I would, yeah, start from the very, very, um, you know, fun, fundamental assumptions. And how you get there again, you have to set up a maybe and uh, sort of like an experimental space to allow one agency one program to be delivered differently because then everybody can see does it work can we learn from that but we still keep our 90 percent of our business as usual so we don't we don't do radical change because radical change is very difficult and hardly works but you have to start from from somewhere and i think the the sort of the your questions about the interme interministerial coordination i think we again is something that we we are sort of we are sticking ourselves um, or we are sort of too much thinking in sort of 20th century ministries are very sort of vertical organizations. We probably have to separate them out and actually ha add a almost like a leadership layer that is very much around po politicians, but also top policymakers working together across some of those issues. They don't belong to one ministry, but they are a team on top of that and then you have line ministries doing more of the routine day-to-day -day delivery day-to-day -day services things like that so i think rethinking that structurally is something that probably not only um countries like you mentioned uh, uh, somalia or egypt are interesting but also you know uk probably should do the same so i think this is something that we are still sort of in many ways working in sort of late 19th century governmental or idea of governments and, and we're you know, we didn't really think of systems, and so yeah, that would be my uh, my 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 very very quick one. Uh, in terms of Paul, yeah, you have you know excellent, um, and I think point, and I think really them. Uh, I think you in many ways answered your own question in terms of like if you have people working with strong systems capabilities and analytical capabilities, the more you can delegate, the more you as a donor you can delegate, decentralize as as a ministry. You see that there is a a unit in in whatever they're really good at. They understand the problems. They you know you can let them go, but it requires these capabilities in in those organizations uh, to be there, of course. And I, in that sense, I agree with you that it's. It's all of those sort of, we, we can never fix all of those trade-offs and, and political perspectives before we are starting on this process. So it is very much a process, I think, and system sustainability might change even very much around beef and uh, organic beef is a perfect example, I think. Our, our, our perspective on that has changed over the last 10 years. And so I think that's why I think capabilities are so, individual capabilities are so, so, so important. And very quickly, I think, uh, uh, who was the, Nicole? I think you were the first one. And um, yeah, there's uh, lots of questions around science and policy. I think, yeah, I think that's why why we really like the, the way to, to work with the organization like FAO, not on a one-off basis that you, we come and go, but actually we develop this long-term relationship so that we know you, you know us, and, and hopefully we can include, like in Rwanda, we had local universities and knowledge partners. And I think this is a, a very, very useful way of building that community of practice in a way, because that leads to, then you can rely on community of practice and saying, you know, this is this is how it works. We can, you know, we can call people up, we can develop use cases, we can develop templates, we can develop all of those training programs. And I think that's where the, 
more of a community of practice rather than separating people out is is important. I'm not sure I really answered your question, but uh, under the pressure of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I'll um, pass to Siobhan. I mean, I think it is an interesting example when it comes to the learning piece about the need for capabilities in many different places. Uh, my experience of, of working for many years in academia was that academics also need to change because they are under pressure to say, does something work or does it not work? They're more likely to get published. Um, they're more likely to support the things that they care about. So academics are actually disincentivized from actually taking more of a learning approach. Um, and so it's nice to hear an academic um, uh, not take that approach. But I mean, that, but I think it goes to show that these capabilities and capacities need to exist in many different places um, beyond uh, beyond government. But um, over to you, Fisherborn, for any uh, feedback. Yeah, just uh, very quickly. Um, but yeah, superb questions. And um, maybe I'll just pick up on Nicole's on your question there on the sensitization. It's an iterative process I think countries different countries are at different stages but I think the role actually of the hub in this that's why it's it's so so important um the the role of this kind of coordination supporting that dissemination accelerating the dissemination accelerating the communication of this type of work and obviously it doesn't, it's not, th these learnings are not operating in, in an island or in, in uh, isolation. There's so much going on, but having that global role for agri-food that supports and channels and acts as a conduit for uh, this type of work, as an example, I think will uh, contribute to, to, that, uh, to that sensitization. So just that I think Reiner did a great job in answering all the other questions. So yeah. thank you. Um we have another question here. Um can I just ask for help about how do I know if someone's got their hand up on the screen? Does anybody know? Uh, okay, so there's a question in the chat, is yeah. there? Okay. But let, let's go to the room first, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Cristina Rapone. I'm a rural migration officer in the Rural Transformation and Gender Equality Division in ESP. And so thanks for, for the discussion and the presentation. It's very uh, interesting. I'm currently working just to, co to complicate a bit more. <laughs> the process is already complicated um, on a piece on uh, enhancing policy coherence between labor migration and agri-food systems. So of course we're already talking about coherence within a system, but then there are also other you know um, domains and aspects that are cross-cutting or cross-sectoral to, um, to that dimension. So so for me it's been. I mean, being thinking through through that has been very stimulating. One thing that uh, while I was working uh, on this piece, I was thinking that it can be overwhelming. Um, and we need to design as, as an, an ambitious goal and target, but also as a process of coherence, because it's not something that can be achieved from one day to another. And the risk is, OK, we can't do anything about it. I mean, it's too, too much. Um, so you know, indicating steps in which we um, we work towards uh, that um, that objective. Um, you already touched upon a bit the how, because my interest was then how we support our um, government uh, counterparts, no? Um, what are the incentives and the types of interactions, the areas of interactions, the levels of coherence, no? We, within, a, within a system, um, uh, at local and national, at regional, there are really many, um, many layers that need to be uh, brought together. And one thing um, that, uh, I mean, uh, I was um, curious to understand more also from, from an FAO perspective. So um, if those training modules are already available, if, you know, we, we can't participate in, in, in those training. Uh, because one thing that I was struggling with is um, not to take agri-food system as, a, as an abstract concept, as you said. Um, because in reality, we, we had a lot of thinking, maybe in the South and South I mean, around policies and areas. But if we look at, at the website, or at least I couldn't find, like not, not a definition, but what are the policies that we do consider when it comes to uh, an agri-food system perspective, no? especially if it interacts with another policy, which could be a labor migration policy. And actually, we probably don't have a policy. I mean, I'm 
I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not really familiar with the Rwanda case, but I was looking, I remember in my research, also at the, uh, at the database of Faulex, and we don't have an agri-food system strategy or agri-food system policies now, so then we are back into different ministries, different policies, what we do consider, how do we bring, bring them together, so what is the framework that we actually are using to to uh, to increase that that coherence, especially when we are uh, then comparing it uh, with uh, with another maybe another sector, because it's not comparing just A and B, but there is A and a system that it, you know environment, consumer policies, agricultural uh, agricultural policies, and as FAO, are we striving or going towards having maybe agri food system strategies, having ministry thinking at the at the national level? maybe with that lens or bringing the different policies and if so, which together through maybe interministerial coordinations and, uh, and systems. So for me, it was difficult to go <laughs> to say, through that process um, and realize that also maybe a year back, I mean, probably this is happening now, but when I was looking into that, it was difficult from an FAO perspective to actually find the tools to offer uh, looking at, uh, at that. So I'm very happy that actually this is underway and, and really eager to learn more. Thank you. Mary Penny uh, would like to uh, comment. So okay, Mary, over Mary. to you. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, yeah, I'm really uh, excited to join you. Your meeting today is, is really resonating with the work and the context in our countries in Europe and, and Central Asia. I'm joined also today by a number of colleagues uh, working on food systems. I just probably make three points. One is related to the, the policy environment and, and what we see in our countries. And as an example, we're just back from Uzbekistan, a number of us, uh, is that the countries have a lot of policies. Each ministry has its line uh, ministry policy. Um, so there are a lot of elements there to work in a more systemic way. Um, they do consult each other when they're developing. So many of our countries, like Uzbekistan, they have a whole system in place to consult, to try to make the policies as solid as possible. Um, where it falls down a little bit is that there are gaps, even though there is that consultation, there definitely are gaps in the policies. Um, one example would be to try to ensure that nutrition and, and healthy diets is seen as a, an, a a, a task beyond the Ministry of Health, that it's it's it also needs agriculture, it needs trade and other ministries, including education, to be on board. So to try to get that, to, to avoid the holes in the policies is one, and, and to see where they can complement each other. Um, so gaps in policies is a challenge. We also have gaps in the national pathways. I think countries worked really well, uh, worked really hard to develop those, but we do see that maybe they're not as uh, all in reaching and systemic as they should be to have a, a whole of government change to food systems transformation. And another gap then we see is when you come to implementation of the policies, the even if the policy is trying to cut across between agriculture and health to do something, when they come to implement, they seem to go back into their silo and implement. Um, second point on governance, I think we do have to recognize, and I think Siobhan said, countries don't aren't starting from zero, and we have many systems within systems, uh, food safety, food loss and waste prevention, urban food systems, that are trying to work, uh, trying to work as a system within a system. So there are experiences, and I guess I liked what Reiner said that, may if I understood that, you know, ministries need to do what they're meant to do. But then maybe the governance structure is that you need this overarching uh, group or policymakers or parliamentarians who are looking across what the, are all the strings coming together. Because the ministries, there are many, many gaps still in the food system, the nuts and bolts, irrigation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we, and what is the added value? I think that's a bit what maybe we're struggling with as well in our region. Um, what is the add-on of now this new energy 
uh, of a uh, food systems transformation. I mean, we very much believe in it, but how do we tra translate that and communicate that with our countries who have many, many uh, challenges and pressures on them? And my last point is just to briefly say, we are in touch with your teams in headquarters, both the F of S Med team and with Siobhan and uh, Elena, and we want to deepen that conversation. Uh, and hopefully, through some of the resources we have in the region, maybe we could uh, even bring in one of our countries from the region to your peer-to-peer -peer country learning event, maybe in November. And also, finally, the issue-based coalition. Yes, as mentioned by Siobhan, we are working across the UN also here at regional level through the issue-based coalition and sustainable food systems. Back to you. Thanks very much. Uh, Mary, uh, thanks very much, Mary, coming in from our FAO uh, European office. And is there anything else? Just very quickly. Um, uh, we also have a question in the chat uh, from Mehnaz uh, from Rwanda. Uh, so taking the example from Rwanda, can you please explain on guidelines or key principles in ensuring effective implementation of the policies developed with a systems approach? Great. Right. Thanks very much. If I could uh, uh, pass back to, to Ina to, to answer that, just to very quickly know about the implementation issue, um, that the work that we're doing on trying to kind of demystify what it means to take a, a systems approach in practice will very much also focus on the approach of actually when you implement and when you act and, 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 and what that means. Um, because this is, a, I think, a, a real gap in the, in the work that's been um, done so far. But over to you, Ina. Yeah, I think um, some of the questions are also for Siobhan, so I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll be very quick because I think the uh, Christina, your question about what should FAO advocate for is it agri food set of policies or I think it's a, it's a really interesting question because if you're doing <clears throat> system analysis, then are you doing systems policies as well, or are policies remaining? And I think that's a, that's a really interesting conundrum with particularly with labor migration, for instance, as I said, some of the countries we are looking at, they are in the structural change of societies. They are on, on path towards that over the next 15, 20 years. Should our system analysis and systems policies around agri-food take that into account already? And, and so I think this is a, a really interesting uh, uh, challenge. And I think it also, in, in different contexts, it probably has different answers to that as well. And I think make compounding the problem i guess in, in many ways that, that agri-food policies might be really different in, in the very different context because in some ca cases you have to look at more health and nutrition in others it's more labor migration and things like that i think that's um in a way it's challenging as interesting as a researcher but of course as a policy advice this is something that that where probably the, the use cases and case studies and, and peer learning will be actually really interesting because countries will recognize that we are in a similar position <clears throat> as other countries and we can learn from them what they did well, what worked in their context. So I think you, you, what we want to get, go away from probably is to sort of like a silver, silver bullet kind of solutions in systems policies as well. Here's how you do systems policy, but but you go more into the level of uh, here's a you know fundamental approach, here are fundamental capabilities we need to have in the system. And then depending on the context, we actually help the countries from that perspective. But I'm, I'm sure Siobhan has, has more to say on that. And I think in, in terms of Mary's points, I think it's absolutely the the fundamental caps in implementation are probably the key challenge for uh, for systems approaches and system transformations because it's it's you know every country has a, or most countries have really really good policies because it's easy to put things on paper but it's very difficult to um to implement them and so actually focusing on implementation as a, as almost like a starting point is something that <clears throat> I think is is also may, maybe uh, maybe advisable rather than focus on only on the policy level. Even when we talk about coherence, for instance, actually bringing the implementation and learning from implementation in there, I think is key. Um, but uh, yeah, I think maybe I keep over to over to Shovan. Yeah, maybe quickly um, on the implementation. Um, so on one level, um, I think the, the work that we're doing with countries like uh, Rwanda, Zambia, I think is also another great example. They've also just recently launched a similar type structured uh, strategy for the agri-food system. And really the emphasis, and there was 
pressure there is not just about framing the policy, looking at the goals, but the how to in terms of the implementation. So the first baby step is getting that how to onto paper and bringing these types of tools that we've been hearing about. And um, and I think this is in response to uh, to Matnas now and, and following through on that um, and uh, uh, looking at how different types of mechanisms, how different types of the institutional reforms or proposals in terms of new institutions, but also the individual capabilities um, uh, introducing um, this notion of, um, yeah, building those institutional individual capabilities um, with that focus on, on the implementation. So that's something that, yeah, FAO is going to be following over the next uh, few years and then using those countries as examples. But as examples, I think this is, I think there was something in your literature as well about this, the, the problem with the copying. Uh, yes. Oh, there's a term for that, that, you know, one size does not fit all. Uh, basically, and that building those individual capabilities so that yep. countries can use a system's uh, thinking for their own context. And they may take ideas from other countries, and that's the role of FAO to bring in those ideas that you're referring to um, in terms of the multi stakeholder collaboration, but their ideas. Uh, and that countries have the capacities and the institutional capacities and the confidence no, to, to adapt and adjust those um, as, as needed. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks very much uh, again for the excellent questions, uh, excellent responses, uh, excellent presentations. And uh, we will take a five minute coffee break now. We'll just have to be very quick. Um, and uh, but I think it was worth I think you'll agree it was worth uh, engaging in that discussion these really uh, excellent questions so uh, thanks very much and uh, we'll uh, move on uh, next to the students and, and talking about the policy coherence and Eleanor uh, will take over as, as moderator but just a, a quick round of applause for, for everybody. Um, we can get started. Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to the second uh, session on policy coherence. Uh, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Elena Ilie, uh, and I'm an economist and an agri-food assistance expert with ESF. So in this session, we're excited to showcase um, the work of uh, four talented students from our partner, uh, University College London. Uh, who have been on placement with us for the past two months. Um, they are in the final stages of their master's uh, degree in public administration, which focuses on how the public sector um, can drive structural change and innovation. So we've had the pleasure of benefiting from their knowledge and skills uh, in our area of agri-food uh, systems. And during their placements, they have conducted research on policy coherence. So looking at various tools that facilitate coherence, both institutional and uh, technical. And their research involved not only desk research, but also direct engagement with several policymakers. So today they will present their findings to us and their presentation will cover an overview of the theories and concepts related to policy coherence a critical review of uh, various tools uh, for policy coherence and the findings from their interviews uh, and focus groups with different policymakers. So uh, since this presentation is part of their formal grading for their master's course, um, after their presentation, I will um, first give the floor to their faculty for comments and questions. And following that, we are um, honored to have also representatives from Ireland and South Africa with us, uh, Tom and Peter, who are interviewed by the students, um, and they will share their thoughts uh, on the findings and the relevance of these findings to the country context. And finally, we will open the floor um, for a Q&A session um, and discussions. We are a bit short of, on time, so hopefully we'll, we will manage to. Uh, and then we will hear closing remarks from uh, Divine Nije, our uh, deputy director. So without further ado, uh, I will now pass the floor to the students and please introduce yourselves before uh, speaking. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much for that introduction, Elena, and it's a real pleasure to be here today with all of you. So my name is Alice and I'm one of the UCL IAPP master's students. Um, thanks to uh, Siobhan and Karina for introducing that program as well. Uh, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Juliet. Um, and online, we're also joined by Dana and Odsuren, who are our other two fantastic team members who will join our presentation uh, from Zoom. Uh, so as Elena introduced, today we're going to be speaking about how we can enhance policy coherence for agri-food systems transformation. Um, and in our project, we looked, uh, we conducted a literature review and then did some great stakeholder analysis to sort of test that. So here is our... Thank you. Uh, here is our agenda for today. So we're going to start with providing a little bit of context for this. Um, and there's already been some great discussion in the room touching on a lot of the key themes that we're going to speak about today. We'll then briefly cover um, the mandate that we received uh, and worked with from FAO before delving into the insights from the literature review, really breaking down the landscape of current uh, tools. Uh, we then are going to look at our stakeholder engagement and try to gather some insights um, about how these tools are currently being used in practice. And finally, we'll sort of combine these two and conduct a, a synthesis and look at some emerging priorities that can be gathered from this research. Fantastic. So without further ado, um, I will hand over to Odsuren online. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Alice. Before delving into the research findings, uh, we would like to touch on the context of policy coherence as it is central to our research. Uh, this slide illustrates the historical evolution of policy coherence and uh, highlights key milestones shaping its development. Initially, discussion on policy coherence focused on maintaining consistency across different policies within one administration. The primary goal was to prevent conflicts between policy objectives. Over time, organizations like the OECD and initiatives such as the SDGs expanded the scope of policy coherence. Currently, efforts are ongoing to refine methodologies and enhance political will to achieve comprehensive policy coherence. Uh, critical aspects of policy integration, um, this slide shows, and ex effective policy integration hinges on two critical aspects, coordination of tasks and efforts among public sector organizations and substantive analy analysis of policy attributes. While each is crucial on its own, their combination of policy coherence is essential for e effective policy integration. According to Parson, there are five distinct types of policy coherence. Understanding these types is key to developing effective strategies, and we we'll delve into in details later. Um, over to you, Dana. Thank you. So moving on to our brief and outputs. A critical challenge governments face is prevalent policy incoherence across various sectors, hindering their capacity to develop their national transformational pathways. This includes issues at different government levels, alignment with sustainability development goals, geographical context, and the interplay between current and future policies. So our primary purpose is to support policymakers in navigating and improving policy coherence. Our project includes the mapping of qualitative analysis tools for agri-food policy coherence to provide an overview of the current landscape. Additionally, we will include case studies showing how different countries successfully manage synergies, trade-offs, and conflict resolution within their agri-food systems. So our main research questions are twofold. The first part focuses on identifying existing qualitative tools and toolkits for policymakers and evaluating their strengths and weaknesses in assessing policy coherence, which will lead to our first output, our literature review. Uh, the second part examines the factors that impede policymakers from achieving policy coherence and explores how they can be best supported to address these challenges. And to answer these research questions, we engaged, we engaged with stakeholders. So we use a double diamond diagram to illustrate our research process. We start off narrow with our brief focus and then broaden out with our discovery through the collection of secondary data. We narrow back to developing an analytical framework and then broaden again through collecting primary data and finally narrowing back with key observations and emerging priorities. So we'll now delve into the first part of our research, exploring the landscape of tools. So looking at our first di diamond, we are currently transitioning from the initial brief uh, research phase to a broader focus as we begin collecting secondary data. 
To begin the analysis of tools for policy coherence, we conducted a secondary, secondary data collection through a literature review, breaking down our research questions and researching relevant studies from uh, Google Scholar for academic study, uh, for academic articles and Google search for gray literature. Our key search terms included mix, uh, policy mix, coherence, trade-offs, policy and institutional mapping, among others. So we screened 35 pieces of literature based on abstracts, conclusions, and our defined research boundaries with inclusion and exclusion criteria. And we extracted information on 42 tools and toolkits, compiling contextual data into tables and graphs and developing our categorization of tools. So the final output was a literature review report integrating our research and figures to inform our analysis. As a guidance in our research, we came up with definitions and uh, we came up with definitions of tools and toolkits. So we define tools as specific techniques or methods to assess design, uh, to assess design, implement or evaluate policies, and toolkits as comprehensive collections of tools for systemic task performance or addressing complex challenges. We will now narrow back down to the categorization of tools and the analysis of their traits. We categorize our sample of 42 tools into four main categories. Uh, the first is qualitative analysis tools, including mapping tools, systems analysis, and pol policy content analysis tools. The second was institutional coordination, including vertical and horizontal coordination tools. The third was stakeholder consultation tools, including institutional and framework or guidance tools. And the fourth was con contextual analysis and strategic planning tools. So looking at our sample of 60, due to some tools fitting into multiple categories, almost half, which makes up 45%, are, quali are qualitative analysis tools, while institutional coordination tools make up a quarter of our sample. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adan. Uh, in this slide, figure four demonstrates the diverse range of sectors and co contributing to policy coherence tools with the uh, intergovernmental organizations like um, UNDP, UNEP, OECD, uh, leading the way alongside philanthropic and academic institutions. Many tools are the results of collaborative efforts. And the figure two traces the origins of these tools, starting with system diagrams, strategic foresight, which emerged between the 30s and 70s, primarily for defense and finance. A significant increase in tools occurred um, around 2015 and 17, uh, post Paris Agreement and uh, 2030 Agenda, with two new tools introduced during uh, 2016 and 17 to align NDCs and SDGs. Uh, here are the top policy coherence tools, um, design thinking and system diagrams, the most popular tools, and uh, right around processes widely used and effective. And finally, mapping tools frequently utilize it for their effectiveness. Uh, this slide shows the types of policy coherence targeted by our tools and some uh, and uh, some key observations. And our tools emphasize sectoral and vertical coherence the most. There's a notable gap in focus on our future policies coherence. And uh, quality, qualitative analysis tools categorized it as category one are the most frequently represented. They show the great versatility in the broad applica applicability in promoting policy coherence across various types. The common themes that emerged from our research, these uh, main themes fall under three, main, uh, three key areas. Uh, firstly, context matters. Suitability of tools depends uh, heavily on the application context. Key contextual factors include political economy, existing policy coherence, and institutional capacity. Conducting a true contextual analysis is essential before applying any other tools. Uh, secondly, political cycles, cycles and institutional prior, prioritizations. Uh, strong and sustained political and institutional support are crucial for successful implementation. Tools that are complex and resource intensive may face challenges gaining support due to competing priorities. Tools designed for long term use aim to endure changes in government uh, machinery. Uh, finally, working together, breaking institutional silos. Many policy coherence tools require collaborative efforts, 
traditional sectoral boundaries often uh, resist this collaborative efforts. And it often true policy coherence practices necessitates a significant organizational shift. Uh, now, the, um, this is the key insights from our in analysis. And the majority of tools, our tools fall under category one, qualitative analysis tools. And uh, collaboration among stock, uh, stakeholders is crucial for the successful implementation of these tools. Engaging diverse stakeholders, including local communities, in his policy coherence efforts. And tools uh, must be flexible and adaptable to suit a specific context e effectively. And long term commitment investment are essential to sustain policy coherence efforts. Uh, finally, finally, there are few tools that address coherence between current and future policies, highlighting a gap in long term planning tools. Okay, great. Thank you both. So now moving on from that literature review, we then took the opportunity to um, gather our own primary data um, through the stakeholder engagement process. Um, so this uh, began the development stage of our research journey where we um, went wide in our process again, gathering a huge amount of input from some excellent stakeholders um, with which to then uh, conduct our final analysis. So our methodology for this um, started with defining our selection criteria. We chose to focus um, on one country from each income bracket. We also wanted there to be a national FAO office in each of these countries. Um, and of course, uh, we needed language accessibility, so they were all English speaking as well. Uh, we then did our own research to identify some key institutions and stakeholders that we could speak to. Uh, and we also leaned on the expertise of the national FAO offices to make some suggestions here as well. We identified some relevant sectors, uh, divisions and departments, and then once we had this list finalised, we were able to connect with the stakeholders. We reached out to schedule some individual one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews, as well as a couple of focus groups, um, and these were semi-structured interviews. We also designed a survey, um, which was able to be distributed more widely, which was a condensed version of this. Uh, we developed the interview questions based on the findings from our literature review so that we could really test these sort of insights that had been raised. Um, and then finally, once we had conducted these interviews, we agreed on an analytical framework through which to analyze these findings. We gathered some observations and key insights, which we're excited to share with you today. Uh, and we then, as a final stage, synthesized these findings to develop a set of emerging priorities. So here's an indication of our engagement questions that we had for our interviews. Um, and it was a similar set of questions that we had in our uh, survey as well, just slightly condensed. Um, so we started off with introductory questions before delving into inst institutional collaboration. Um, we then also spoke about the specific use of policy analysis tools as a sort of key focus of our research and any experience our stakeholders had with using these tools. We also wanted to learn about how they conduct stakeholder engagement as a very uh, central part of policy coherence, um, as well as some of the key challenges and solutions. So we heard about some of the constraints that they identify um, in using policy coherence tools, um, as well as some of the incentives for working together across institutions and even internationally. Finally, we asked them what sort of external support they might like to receive or they feel could be useful in this space, um, as well as prompting any other um, insights that they had for our research. We do at this stage want to point out a couple of the limitations from our research. Um, as has been mentioned, this was a pretty short, intensive research project, and with that does come some inherent, inherent limits. Um, so we did have a limited uh, stakeholder response rate just within this really short project timeframe. Uh, we also used convenience sampling, which of course is in no way representative and limits the amount which we, we can generalise these findings. We also ended up having uh, a relative lack of engagement with direct policymakers themselves, which were initially um, a key audience that we did want to engage with. Um, so with this, um, we would suggest that this analysis shouldn't be generalised. However, what we hope that you can take from this um, is some great qualitative insights, which can hopefully back up some of the work that you guys are already doing at FAO. Okay, and on to Juliet to get into what uh, happened in our interviews. Thank you, Alice. Uh, so during our stakeholder engagement, we spoke to a total of 25 um, governmental actors, combining both the response from the surveys and interviews. So South Africa was uh, the most represented country, followed by Ireland. 
Um, so in terms of the role of these governmental actors, uh, the highest represented sector was uh, were research and government departments. So we mostly engage uh, with specialists, providing evidence to inform policy, technical expertise, and consulting service. So before delving into the observation drawn from the stakeholder engagement, we wanted to present you an overview of the tools um, used from our sample of 25 participants. So we combined uh, the categories of qualitative analysis tools and contextual analysis and strategic planning tools, because in the situation shared with us, the tools were overlapping and complementing each other. And institutional coordination tools category was uh, highly represented during our interviews, and a few stakeholders shared using multi-stakeholder consultation tools, uh, which included include engagement with stakeholders from outside the government. So just to locate us now, we're uh, narrowing down our second uh, research phase um, to key observations and identifying emerging priorities from this collection of secondary data. So a first observation uh, we made is the linear approach to evidence-based uh, policy in multiple cases. A lot of stakeholders shared the gap and disconnection um, between scientists and policymakers when it comes to transferring knowledge into the political sphere. So this highlights the need to develop specific capabilities to translate scientific knowledge into actionable resources for policymakers. So to provide a more practical perspective, one stakeholder from a scientific uh, research council shared insights about the power dynamics between the research council and the agriculture department. And those power dynamics uh, were leading to unequal distribution of responsibility and accountability for policy um, coherence. So in fact, the research council was mostly tasked with the evidence gathering stage of policy making and had very limited influence when it comes to the actual decisions for the policy development. And this gap was also observed in the policy making to policy implementation chain, where in some governmental structure, um, agencies are tasked with evaluating and formulating uh, policies and required buy-in for implementation agencies. And therefore, this uh, fragmental, fragmented institutional setup um, and reliance on fluctu fluctuating political interest hinders the efforts toward um, achieving and operating through policy coherence. A second observation was uh, a major trend in adopting a systemic approach to developing national agri-food system strategies. So those strategies are crafted using a systemic lens, um, through a systemic lens and using mostly contextual analysis and strategic planning tools, such as strategic foresight. So we encountered a few examples, such as the One Food Programme, funded by the UK and Lunch in South Africa, Ireland Food Vision 2030, and uh, the Philippine Development Plan. So those strategies employ cross-sectoral collaboration to identify trade-offs, synergies, and their broader impact. Another strength is the use um, of monitoring and evaluation of the strategies implementation to inform future decisions. So for example, in Ireland, governmental actors had to report monthly on their progress toward achieving this strategy. And similarly, in Philippines, they created a development report to provide an overview of the progress in the strategy implementation and also to evaluate the respective uh, program to ensure alignment with the overarching uh, objectives. Uh, another observation was the lack of capabilities in public organization to uh, actually being able to use the policy coherence tools. So it was observed that many stakeholders uh, considered as the target user for the tools are actually not exposed to system thinking in the first place and um, are not even familiar with the concept of trade-offs and synergies. And there was a specific example shared with us 
uh, from the first user of the SDG Synergy tool developed by the UNDP, uh, the first user being um, an Irish international consi consultancy state agency um, that shared that the, the actual application of the SDG Synergy tool um, was hindered by the lack of knowledge around system thinking, trade-off synergies, and actually impacted the usefulness of the tool, which is initially about identifying the area to prioritize, to better allocate resources and pinpoint the necessary capabilities. And this observation led us to explore um, the opportunity of using dynamic capabilities that were introduced uh, by Reiner. And so those capabilities uh, were initially introduced by the academic uh, David Tis, and it is the ability to integrate, build, and reconfigure internal and external resources and skills to address and shape a rapidly changing environment. And so we do uh, believe from those observations that uh, by adopting those dynamic capabilities, public organization would be able to um, transform their organizational routines in order to better adapt their resources um, needed in a changing agri-food system and reshape the design process of policies um, to work toward policy coherence. And lastly, our last observation is um, the important role that can in play independent statutory body in ensuring policy coherence. So a specific example, again, was shared with us, with us about an independent statutory body um, working to ensure food safety within the national agri-food system. And so the strategy of this body is structured around five key roles, adopting an integrated approach um, to enforce the adoption the adoption of food safety um, legislation across sectors, mandating thereby across sectoral collaboration, uh, but also making decisions based on scientific evidence and operating a legal framework, which prevents the organization from depending and again fluctuating political interests. Also en engaging with multidisciplinary stakeholders through advisory committees and consultations, um, which, which allow to include diverse um, perspectives and interests in order to develop more balanced policies, but also create an opportunity to collect feedback and answer concerns from different sectors. Um, the fourth one being also aligning with global standards uh, global food safety standards, which ensure also transnational uh, coherence. And finally, ensuring public accountability uh, through a combination of mechanisms such as transparent communication, um, oversight mechanisms, complaint systems, among others. And I will, I will hand it back to Alice to present our emerging priorities. Thank you, Julia. So um, now taking um, those insights that Julia has just mentioned and comparing those back to our literature review, we were able to come up with some emerging priorities and sort of keeping in mind the limitations of this research, we envisioned that these could be used by intergovernmental organisations like FAO to sort of um, share, uh, direct their support offering um, and also as some guidance for where to direct future research, which is definitely needed in this area. So our first priority here is about um, promoting that non-linear approach, um, which aims to overcome the sort of gap um, between uh, research knowledge and policy making that we heard about um, in our engagement. Um, so to develop a, a truly non-linear and a more of a holistic approach to evidence-based policy making, there are a couple avenues and strategies through which to do this. So firstly, we heard that there is a real need to develop stronger links and partnerships networks across sectors to um, facilitate this integration um, and also just promoting a holistic uh, research and innovation environment where research and policy are integrated. Um, so creating this sort of um, alteration to the actual environment itself. Secondly, um, there are a couple of institutional changes which we heard about from our uh, 
engagement, which was also reflected in our literature review. Um, so there is the idea about introducing intermediaries who um, have sort of uh, research and evidence gathering skills and they're able to speak to the research community while also understanding the intricacies of policy making um, and being a real key player in this integration effort. Um, and also there's a lot of value from organizing interactive forums where policymakers and research can have the physical space to uh, collaborate. Uh, finally, um, around this capabilities piece that we've been mentioning a few times, um, there is a need to um, sort of enhance capabilities on both sides of this. So enhancing researchers' abilities to communicate their findings actually effectively to policymakers, creating user-friendly tools which policymakers can then uh, implement easily. And we also heard that policymakers as well can improve their capabilities in being more familiar with using scientific evidence and backing that up in their decision making. Um, and here on the screen, we have a couple of the direct quotes from our engagement, which um, really point to the value of this, um, suggesting that, you know, when it comes to translating research into actual guidance, there is a huge disconnect between scientists and policymakers, which is a gap that we do need to bridge. And this is something that uh, kept coming up in our engagement. So our second priority area is about refining policy coherence efforts themselves. So if uh, organizations like FAO are going to be sort of a, a leader um, in these uh, in policy coherence uh, tools, these are some of the things which they can uh, help partners to refine. So initially, um, we heard again and again that actually before using these tools, um, the unique context in which they're uh, about to be applied should really be deeply analysed and understood and that this needs to be really the starting point. Um, if you're trying to implement tools before conducting a deep analysis of the context, there's much less likelihood that it's going to be effective. And also this plays a big role in selecting the right tool um, for that context. Um, secondly, um, when actually designing or building a new tool, um, we heard that engaging with the desired end user at the very start of that process is central. Um, this will ensure the relevancy of the tool as well as securing buy-in um, and meaning that these people are actually going to use it in their day-to-day -day process. And this is especially relevant um, if those uh, end users are uh, governments um, and ensuring government um, input in the development is really helpful. Um, and finally, the last one on this theme um, is about who you engage with when you're working in policy coherence efforts. Um, so, of course, with policy coherence, it's really valuable to work with the willing, those who are already on board, have some sort of understanding um, and perhaps already see the value of this. Um, and while that's, of course, hugely valuable, we also heard that there is a real need to bring to the table the more sceptical um, and perhaps resistant stakeholders, because um, such a huge part of policy coherence is working through disagreement um, and finding common ground to move forward. And our final priority theme here is about the specific sort of country level support that intergovernmental organizations um, could provide. And this is sort of coming directly um, from that question asking our stakeholders where they identify the most valuable areas. So um, firstly, there's a real need to invest upstream in the targeted users capacities to engage with these tools. And this is sort of twofold. We, we kept hearing that developing general awareness of systems approaches will be really helpful, especially in sort of upskilling the future generation of policymakers who are going to need to use these tools. Um, and also directing funding towards collaborative policy coherence efforts is a great way to encourage participation um, in these tools. Secondly, um, organizations like FAO um, our stakeholders would, would like to receive more solid advice um, on how to actually turn these aspirational commitments that they've made into actionable programs. Um, and so this, this can be done by sort of uh, targeting support interventions after strategies have been developed. We heard that this is something which countries that we spoke to feel pretty comfortable in developing themselves, but it's more about clarifying the responsibilities um, and turning these, these aspirations into solid, solid action plans. And finally, um, there is, we heard about a need to sort of guide countries, especially maybe um, lower income countries through the complex agri-food environment, especially at this international level. We, did, we heard that even for experts, this is a really difficult system to navigate um, and they're unsure about how some of the support avenues work, what, they can, what support they can receive. Um, and so identifying the existing support opportunities and then making tailored recommendations would be really valuable. Um, and again, here are some quotes um, from our stakeholders that backed this up. And with that, that is the close of our presentation. Thank you all so much for listening. And now we'll come to some questions and feedback. Thank you.
Uh, thank you so much. I think these are really great findings, um, very interesting, especially considering the such short amount of time that you had. So congratulations. And I think some of your findings also provide some answers to the questions that we had in the previous session. Uh, so since this is part of your grading, I will now give the floor to IIPP faculty for comments and questions. Over to you, Reiner, and please only keep it to 10 minutes. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I actually like to give the floor to Isadora, who's online, and, and she's the second marker, as it were. And so over to you, Isadora. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you today and the students. Um, that's a really fantastic presentation. I'm incredibly impressed at how much you were able to do in your two weeks and um, really taking on four research questions is no easy task. I think I would start my reflection um, with highlighting your point on kind of the importance of context and the importance of nuance here that's coming out. And I'm curious what came up for you in either the tools or toolkits that are specific to the challenge of agri-food systems, different to any other problem that surfaced in either your literature review or your interviews, kind of the nuance there. Um, I'd be curious about kind of what are the unique dynamic capabilities necessary for solving agri-food system challenges? Yeah, go ahead. Um, hello, thank you for your question. Um, so in terms of uh, the relationship with the tools, so one of the interesting categories that could be linked uh, to exploring more uh, the adoption of dynamic capabilities is uh, coming from the contextual analysis and strategic planning tools category, which was... Um, so, which include, for example, design thinking, um, sy system diagrams, also strategic foresight. And initially, those tools were not uh, our main focus uh, during our research. We were mostly focusing on qualitative analysis tools. But through the research, we, ca we came across those tools that are um, very relevant to actually engaging in um, working toward policy coherence within food systems, as uh, the reason being that um, dynamic capability tools, uh, such as uh, shaping, um, connecting, saving, um, do require a strong understanding of uh, the system you're working within. And so beyond uh, actually building system map, causal loop diagrams, understanding the different components, it is also very understand to, it is very important to understand also what are the power dynamics within the systems? What are, um, like beyond the structure itself, what are the different interests? Who are the person actually at the table speaking and the one uh, whose interests are not necessarily heard? And so the contextual analysis and strategic planning tools uh, allow to understand uh, those important information that allows to also identify the starting point and make some compromise because it allows to um, understand what is the actual context we're working with it. What are the power dynamics? Uh, who are the people that are actually influencing the decisions that are being made? Um, so I don't know if it answers your question. It is a bit broad, but... Uh, yeah. yeah, that's very helpful. Uh, I might just add to that point. I definitely agree with what you're saying. Um, and just to clarify that most of our research really did narrow down on agri-food challenges specifically, so we can't comment too much on challenges um, sort of from other areas. Um, but I think the context that we heard a little bit about in our engagement and through our desk research was really quite different in each of these countries. And just one example um, of that is learning about the specific um, sectors and industries and how they interact together. Um, and that in each country that we spoke to, there were sort of different challenges around who doesn't speak to who and the sort of existing structures. Um, and also I think there's a lot of sort of tradition and culture elements like you were mentioning before um, that play a role in that with traditionally in this country, how agri-food challenges handled with. And 
we did hear from one stakeholder um, that the, the scientific community um, and the research community um, perhaps doesn't always engage with the with food um, as, as a priority area and there's perhaps not this prioritization which would really help and that there's sort of a bit of a paradigm shift that, um, that perhaps needs to happen in order to, to better tackle these agri-food challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Reiner, do you want to uh, share a question? Or I can keep going. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> um, all right. So then I think my second question is really about um, you shared a tremendous amount of ref uh, recommendations and reflections, which I think is really great. But I'm interested in where you would start. Um, kind of what is the starting point or the highest magnitude leverage point uh, recommendation you would take to kind of steer the FAO or a similar intergovernmental organization to uh, kind of really further policy coherence. So my question is really, what's your starting point? What's your day one recommendation? I think the starting point depends on the context of each country. So there is no one starting point um, that to be that can be generalized. But I from the feedback we got during the interviews, the insights that were shared and through our literature review, like one thing that seems to be missing or maybe not missing, but that is maybe not the major focus and maybe it should be, is understanding what are the internal capabilities of the countries that are targeted by those programs and the development of these tools? What are their resources? What are their skill? Um, what is their exposure to um, the concept of policy coherence? But beyond the, the concept of policy coherence, what it implies? Um, and I think, I mean, we believe that understanding those capabilities and ma making sure that before actually introducing a tool, there are um, some internal capability, some capability training happening. So the actors can actually then become familiar with the concept, the concept, be aware of it and be interested in actually using these tools. Because one of um, an interesting observation we, met, we made is that in, during our literature review, 75% of uh, our tool sample are qualitative analysis tools. So it's true that we did not engage directly with policymakers who might be uh, some stakeholders more in the situation of using those tools, and which highlights the gap of actually the specialist not being exposed to or responsible for policy coherence, because if they were, they would maybe mostly use this tool. But the, the point here is that 75% of our literature review ended up finding qualitative analysis tools. But when we engage with stakeholders, the tools that came back the most were institutional coordination tools and stakeholder consultation tools. And they were not very familiar with the actual existence of those qualitative analysis, analysis tools, which highlights the gap between informing about the existence of this tool and making sure beyond informing that they would be interested in using them and aware of the benefits they could get from those tools. Yeah, I absolutely agree. That's also what, what comes to mind for me as an important starting point. And um, I think we also heard a lot um, that we can't under sort of undervalue the the importance of recognizing that the the skills and the sort of mindset and sort of worldview with which policymakers analyze um, analyze policies traditionally is not really um, appropriate for a policy coherence lens. That is a pretty dramatic shift. Um, I think, to really taking on a systems lens. Um, and our stakeholders um, informed us and we sort of saw from the literature that this isn't something which is, at least in the countries we spoke to, really widely acknowledged. So I think it comes back to sort of providing um, the skills and sort of maybe shaping the environment a little bit more to alter the conversation and really um, embed a systems lens. And I think that this can also be done on a really broad level and even sort of in academic institutions, you know, at IPP, um, something we talk about is sort of um, rewriting the curriculum of public administrators. And I think that this is also an avenue through which sort of policy coherence could really, really be helped with the future generation. 
Fantastic. That's really great. That's it for me. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we are also at, at time. So I, I don't I don't need to have ask any questions because I was also the primary supervisor for the students. I just wanted to uh, congratulate you on, on such a great job and uh, you had such a limited time for doing qualitative uh, research uh, interviews and everything. I think you did a brilliant job. So congratulations, congratulations only from my side. Thank you very much. Personally, I would give you the highest grade. So. Yeah. <laughs> so moving on, I would like now to invite uh, to speak two of the policymakers who were interviewed by the students. Um, we have Tom Arnold from Ireland. Uh, Tom is an agricultural economist and public policy advisor who has worked for the European Commission, Commission and the Irish Department of Agriculture and Food, among other organizations. And Tom recently has also served as the chair of Ireland's Agri-Food Strategy Committee, which is one of Ireland's um, coordination mechanism for the development of its uh, agri-food policy. So Tom, thank you very much uh, for accepting our invitation to speak. Um, we have heard previously from Reiner and also from the students in their presentation that um, agri-food systems requ transformation requires um, a long-term perspective, uh, mechanisms for learning uh, what work and what doesn't work, uh, and ensuring public accountability for the results. So uh, would you say that um, this resonates with um, Ireland's experience? And if so, could you talk a bit about uh, the process? Thank you. Over to you, Tom. Thank you. First of all, it's been a real pleasure to participate in this and to listen carefully uh, this morning. And I, I think there's a lot which has been said, which indeed resonates to uh, with the process that, that I chaired. Uh, it, it, now, it, it, that process covered about an 18 month period from January 2020 to the end, July 2021, coinciding, of course, with, with COVID. So I want to, I, 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 I was told I have about five minutes. So I want to make essentially five points in talking and talking about the, the Irish experience. Uh, I'm not suggesting that Ireland is a complete model for anywhere else, but I think some of the things uh, I want to talk about could be adapted to other national circumstances. And there was a very wise comment made there in the last uh, presentation in regard to a question, where where is the starting point? And of course, this the answer was very correctly. The starting point depends on the context of each country. So, for, so first of all, um, just a little bit of context for Ireland. Our, Ireland's agri-food strategy has been developed with using a stakeholder-led approach for over since the year two thousand. So we've had five of these processes since 2000. There are five-year rolling strategies, and I was asked to chair the, the most recent one. So my five points are really around the following. First of all, the need to build on your existing history um, and be very risk realistic about your starting point. I, I'll expand on each of these in a moment. Secondly, the need to take time to develop clarity in the terms of reference given to uh, the stakeholder group and what the purpose of the strategy is. Very important. Thirdly, develop clarity as well in regard to the ground rules and the work process that the group will follow. Fourthly, everybody is going to have a time frame for their work. And I think it's very important to have a time frame. And if it's an ambitious time frame, all the more important. But it's also then that brings into question how the process is to be managed. And finally, and really connecting with the uh, issue of, of today, the issue of policy coherence, I think there needs to be very considerable realism about what can be achieved uh, in, in seeking policy coherence. And there needs to be... Uh, I would say a real effort to identify a limited number of key priorities that will be the focus of policy coherence. You can't be coherent across a huge range of areas. You have to make choices. And the sooner, the earlier those choices are made, the better. 
So if I can turn then in a little bit more detail for each of these issues. As I say, Ireland has the benefit, has had the benefit of having five of these processes since 2000. And I mean, the advantage of that is that you, you develop a sense of an experience, you develop, you won't have the same people involved in all, in, in each, in any of them, but you'll have some common experience among people who sit on these committees and uh, uh, that is very important, both in terms of framing the, the strategy and in implementing the strategy. Um, so if you have, if you if you have the experience of having a number of multiple strategies, learn from that, gain from it. If you haven't, start. I think that's the key message, and it is crucially important that w there is a realism about where you're starting from. And uh, this brings to the, into sharp focus the issue that was discussed at the beginning of today's seminar, the issue of the political economy within which change you're expecting to recommend change and to achieve change. The second point is uh, regarding the actual process itself. And here I want to talk about two things. First of all, the representative group. Our, our process had a, a group of 32 people, and uh, which, of which I chaired. And the, obviously, the, that representative group will be to some extent self-selecting in that the, probably the main interest groups across the sector will have to be represented. And that's as it is, and that's fine. It's also very important, I think, to build into that into a group like this uh, some independent voices, independent, uh, you know, with, with clearly a credible level of expertise. That's very important. Um, the other thing is that uh, setting, uh, we, yeah, I'll go on to the ground rules in, in a moment, but. Um, the terms of reference for our group was developed by government after a large scale consultative process with the public. And that would have also taken account of some of the experience in, in previous categories. So we, were, we had the advantage of having a very clear objective set for the group. We were to, to develop a, a strategy which enable the sector to say they would be leaders in sustainable food systems over the coming decade. And sustainability defined in its three dimensions, economic, environmental, and uh, social sustainability. So uh, that clarity of purpose is, I think, of huge importance. And time should can usefully be taken, uh, you know, to, in order to achieve that clarity of purpose. The second, the, the, the other thing I wanted to talk about, the third point is that how important it is that the, 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 there are clear ground rules established at the beginning of a process, process like this for the work ahead. And in our case, what we agreed at the very beginning was a set of operational principles by which the group would uh, operate. And they were, they were quite high level things that we agreed to, things like trust, confidentiality, uh, collegiality. Now, all of that contributed, and they were accepted at the very beginning of our work. Uh, but the purpose of, of establishing those ground rules is to develop the sort of, uh, I would say, culture and group dynamic which can ultimately help in the work that's ahead of people and help maybe arrive at compromises and difficult compromises when, when they are necessary. So that is, is of really a big importance. The other thing that we, we, discussed, discussed, uh, we agreed at the very beginning was that we were going to uh, develop our strategy using a food systems approach. And that was, again, uh, quite an innovation because not, none of the previous Irish strategies had, had, had used that approach. So we were clear that we were going to use a, a full value chain approach to that. Uh, we, we had people across the value chain who were represented on the committee. And so we were, we were committed from the beginning 
uh, to using that that approach. But here there is also a, an important issue that was touched upon during uh, this morning's discussion. The need to try to make sure that when we talk about food systems, we are not overcomplicating life. We are not developing a level of complexity which makes it impossible uh, to to, uh, uh, to operate, to operate in the analysis and to operate in the recommendations. So that I, I think is hugely important, and that comes will come to uh, the last two points that I want to make as well. The time I think it's important that, that committees are given a, 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 an ambitious but realistic time frame to do their work. And so from from the beginning, you're you're you know you know that this is not going to be a completely elastic process. Tom, so so sorry to interrupt. Uh, could you please try to wrap up in the next minute or so? Yes, I'm doing exactly that. Thank you. Uh, so I mean, the, the issue of, of trying to ensure that even if you're starting off on a process where you're discussing individual issues, as you begin to from secondly from the second half of that process onwards, you're beginning to shape. What, look, what may be the, the, the shape of the final report. That's very important. And then the final issue is policy coherence. And here we do have to realize that policy coherence and working in a food system approach is a new and difficult experience for many people. And so there's going to have to be real realism as to what's achievable. And there we go back to the political economy. In our case, what we did where we, we made, I think, in, in important gain, important innovations was the focus we put on the link between uh, agriculture and the environment and the need to agree a basic set of deliverable objectives which uh, could be, del could be uh, delivered. Secondly, the issue of food and health. Uh, and here we found very quickly that there was no culture of co collaboration between the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health. So again, we had to recommend that that culture be established. And then the thirdly, the, the issue of making sure that our domestic policy on sustainable food systems was in line with, and with our pol international policy international development policy on food systems. So that, I'm sorry to, to, to have to cut so short, but that I think are the essential elements what I think are relevant to the discussion here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. That was super insightful and open. I'm conscious of time, so I will move straight to our second speaker. Uh, we also have Dr. Peter Jacobs from South Africa. Uh, Peter is the strategic lead in the Human, Human Sciences Research Council, and he has conducted extensive research in relation to rural innovation and agri-food systems, and has been working closely with policymakers for the development of policies. Um, so, Peter, uh, thank you for being here. Um, what we have heard in the students' presentation is that there is this gap between uh, research and uh, policy making, uh, where intermediaries um, that understand both uh, policy planning and the research side can play a role. So, do you think organizations like uh, the Research Council that you are part of can uh, fill in can help fill in this gap and? How does the Human uh, Sciences Research Council play this part in South Africa? Thank you. Over to you. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be part of this conversation. Uh, uh, so, sorry about that uh, little uh, internet uh, problem and trouble that I'm having. Uh, the Human Sciences Research Council is a national council that fall under the South African government's Department of Science and Innovation. And so we do a lot of research that's linked to uh, state priorities or, or state requests uh, in different uh, areas. And I'm just uh, fortunate to be working in the area of food policy uh, more, more broadly, or food and nutrition security policy, as it's called here. So the Human Science Research Council uh, takes up a variety of different types of research activities uh, with the state as well as with non-state actors. So my role is, has not been as, as practical and at the cold phase as Tom's role in Ireland, but I have interacted with a, a variety of policy processes here 
especially through uh, work that's been commissioned uh, by the by the government for us to do a little bit of investigation on what is happening in food policy, the uh, monitoring and evaluation of food policy impacts on local communities, and just data gathering, also supporting the National Science Co Statistics Council or statistics body to collect and refine its own instruments in collecting data and information about food policy. So it's all about evidence-based food policy and supporting evidence-based food policy. Uh, that's my specific role, but HSRC more broadly is concerned with what evidence-based policy support to the government. So for, 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 from my point of view, there are basically three areas that uh, resonate with me with regard to the policy coherence work that uh, the colleagues have presented so well today. And congratulations to them. It's a wonderful piece of work. And we have a great platform for a lot of additional uh, research to be conducted uh, in this pathway that they've opened up for us. So the first one is, I think the HSRC is very limited uh, to a specific area of being responsive to the government, and then it generates data, and then it disseminates it. Beyond this dissemination of scientific output, it's the pathway that we have very limited control and influence over. And this is the pathway around uptake, the utilization of the science in the policy space, uh, as well as seeing or bringing about the actual real world changes. And for us, the, the, the greatest overarching um, dynamic in this is what we call, what I refer to as what is called getting the timing right. Because the evolution of policy takes place over multiple periods, and it's not enough just I therefore to focus purely on learning capabilities as, as uh, what, what Professor uh, Reiner uh, highlighted in the beginning, but you've got to get the timing right. If you, if you miss the, the beat on timing, you will be delayed and you will be very, very far behind. So HSRC therefore is in a very fortunate position, but it is, it's got to navigate the pathway around what is referred to as filtering into of, of scientific messages into policy. But this filtering doesn't take place within the HRC. This takes place by advisors that are all found within the state. The second point is I think there is not only the fragmentation of competing mandates and uh, structures and priorities of state uh, officials and government departments. There are also, I think, competing paradigms. And uh, Tom alluded to this in political economy, but I think the research team uh, highlighted the, the, the importance uh, of, of that front. So this is the so-called elephant in the room that there are competing paradigms of the approach that's informing the way in which food policy is being made, but this is not always put up front. And engaging with this within the policy establishment may be one of the most difficult areas to get science or scientific insights into policy as well as establishing the idea of policy coherence. We're experiencing that specifically now with my third area that I want to speak to, which is the final area, is transformative food policy is nonlinear. And this is the example of two areas in which you can apply this, the nonlinearity in bringing about transformative food policy. It's not just necessarily a new idea of transformative food policy, but the nonlinearity in it is got to, you've got to be mindful of multiple actors, multiple times, which is the, of, of, of how the policy process can be influenced and whether it is a policy that is aligned with what political interests leading uh, government departments would be sensitive to. If you come, like in the case of the one food example that I want to finish off on, uh, which is an external uh, project and process that is basically about holistic food policy transformation instead of fragmented food policy transformation, which is really the norm in South Africa uh, up, up till now. That is an external project that hasn't uh, been rooted within the South African realities. So we are confronted with bringing this very novel, very uh, great approach into the South African reality and what are the obstacles that we are likely to confront. We are likely to confront the first obstacle of trying to parachute an idea, a concept, a framework, an approach from outside South Africa into the South African policy domain. 
what will the receptiveness, responsiveness within the policy environment be to that? So there is uh, the, the, I think the, the lowest hurdle to, to cross would be the learning capability hurdle to generate greater awareness of holistic transformative food policy. But there are other hurdles that we're going to have to confront along the, along the way. And I think that uh, would be some of the learnings and lessons that we've learned as a science council trying to influence policy. It is not an easy process beyond what you do as your science council. There are fragmented mandates that are rooted in, I think, competing uh, paradigms and political economy approaches to food policy, and that food policy change is nonlinear. And with the one food process, I think we've got to be uh, hyper aware of the nonlinearities that will be what that will confront us going along that pathway. So those are the, the learnings and lessons from our side uh, in South Africa. Thank you so much. Uh, round of applause. Uh, thank you both, Tom and Peter. I think it's great to hear about how these findings play out at the country level. Mm -hmm. So we're coming towards uh, the end of the session, but uh, we can still take one or two burning questions. Um, so I would like to open the floor. Also online, if there is any question. For the students and I think also for the presenters in the first session as well. Yes, Marco, please go ahead. Yeah, I can't. Just curious if the. Uh, please uh, use the uh, microphone. Okay. Also for the online audience. Yeah, I was just curious to know if the local dimension of the uh, food system was considered, but in the interviewed but also in the reference that we you had from as a result from the from the study so this was a uh, the main question but also i was curious about to know you mentioned that there was this uh ability to transform the scientific knowledge to some more something more suitable for policymakers so how do you think this can be practically achieved and in which form thank you thank you marco uh, another question. Go ahead, Paul. A very good question. First of all, I commend you on excellent work. A really, really good uh, report in, in a very short period of time. And obviously, personal interest from our side uh, or Ireland side was it's great to see that it's coming through as an example. I guess uh, what we're talking about a lot of times are the challenges. And I'm wondering from your experience, your research, your work, and talking to the various different uh, representatives. Are you optimistic about the possibility of the systems approach addressing or helping us to address some of these big challenges that we're struggling with? Or what, as you walk away from these two weeks of intensive work, how do you feel about it? Thank you, Paul. Uh, who would like to give an answer to Marco and then Paul? Um, I can start and feel free, Juliet, um, to jump in at any point. Um, but for your question about did we engage with sort of the local level um, sort of um, people working on the ground and policy making, um, in our interviews we didn't, um, or our or our interview uh, or our survey as well. This was something which we spoke about as a team um, and which we really would have love to do it, it really did feel like a little strange to conduct this research without being able to speak to people actually working out on the field um however i guess it was just down to the limitations um and we really wanted to leverage the existing relationships that fao had um and so that was mainly with sort of um high level um policy makers and a lot of specialists and experts so definitely that's um another limitation which we should highlight in our research was that this um really focuses on that perspective and it would be another piece of work i think entirely to consult with um the the local level which which would be great did you want to uh concerning the systemic approach so it's a really good and interesting question and i mean we we do have some insights regarding that but not not enough i would say to 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 make a, a conclusion uh regarding this question but um from from the, the insights we got with the stakeholder we engage with um we were first of all uh, very pleased to see that it was an approach that was being used for Philippines, Ireland, South Africa, 
um, the countries we talked to, each of them actually used uh, this approach to develop their national agri-food system strategy. And through this approach, they were actually able to um, collaborate across sectors and talk with health uh, department, agriculture, with agriculture department, trade, um, environment, um, and in our literature review, we also saw education to create this awareness. And those collaborations were made possible but through this approach and realizing how the systems work and who are the actual stakeholders that needs to be involved um, in this thinking and um, transformation of the agri-food system. However, um, it's something that uh, needs to be considered uh, and would be an area to explore is even though you adapt this system systemic approach, how do you um, deal with the power dynamic? Again, we're coming back to that, but it is something that we did study also and that came back a few times is even though you understand this uh, the need for this cross-sectoral cross collaboration, there are still those power dy dynamics that made that make some interests becoming more important to the eyes of certain stakeholders that do hold most of the power and therefore as uh, a space into the decision making. So it's good to adopt this approach, but you also need to deal with how are the actors actually sharing this space and making sure that they do find a common ground that ensure balanced policies and equal trade-off um, to, to transform this system. Great, thank you. Um, and to the to the final question, and I guess we can both share um, our thoughts about sort of how we feel about policy coherence efforts um, in general. But I do just want to clarify for the audience that this was a just under two months project, not two weeks. That would have been really quite something. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, but um, at the beginning, I think uh, none of us were familiar with policy coherence theory, and I don't think any of us had any experience working um, or even researching agri-food systems. So it's really been an incredible um, two months, um, and we've loved learning as much as we can from FAO. They've been incredible partners and collaborators. Um, and it's been really great to really immerse ourselves um, over the last two months. And I think for me, Personally, I do feel quite hopeful about sort of the policy coherence ideas, but um, similar to, I think, uh, a point Reiner raised earlier, you know, it's not a solution in any sense. It's not a, a silver bullet. I more view it as a precondition to solving some of these grand challenges. But I think that if this precondition was achieved and that we worked in a more coherent um, fashion globally and sort of a systems lens was really adopted in a widespread manner where people really understand how a small change in one part of the system has huge ripple effects somewhere else in the system that that we would be much better equipped to deal with some of these um, some of these challenges so I hope that um, this is an area that continues to grow thank you I think we are coming to an end um, before passing uh, for closing remarks so uh, I would like to share um, concluding uh, thought. Um, so I think what we have heard today in both sessions uh, is that a systems approach is hard uh, and countries and not only countries, but organizations, um, regions, cities, and, and so on, they all have, um, they all start with different levels of capabilities uh, for adopting a systems approach. Uh, but for example, if one policy area delivers good results, um, these results uh, can also change the system and in this way also build up capabilities and also open up the space for other policy areas to come in and other uh, stakeholder, uh, stakeholder groups or what uh, Reiner was calling social partners uh, allows them to become stronger and also have a say at the table. And um, so we have this evolving state of the system. I think also uh, this relates to what Paul was saying in the first session. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, I would like to give the floor to Divine uh, Nidja, our Deputy Director, for closing remarks. Thank you, thank you. Um, good day, everyone, and for th uh, those connected as well. I, I was also... Uh, connected and I, I followed everything from uh, from the office, handling a number of things in parallel. But it has been 
It has been definitely very captivating, even from the other side. I was so excited uh, following the different uh, presentations, which were, you know, full of content. I think for the uh, short time we've had, it's been very, very rich and very, very informative, even, even for me. I, I have been dealing with uh, this subject over the last uh, couple of years, but every day I learn something new. And today I definitely learned something new. So um, it's it's definitely been uh, in, important to uh, uh, to add this uh, to the repertoire of uh, things we have on learning on how policy making for agri food systems. Uh, transformation might be improved through uh, better uh, insights into policy coherence and policy frameworks and tools for uh, improving uh, public sector capabilities. ESF division led by uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Corinna Hawks and more generally FAO, the organization, has to consider how these learnings, these very, very valuable learnings can contribute to how our, uh, our members, the governments can uh, design their reforms and implement agri-food uh, uh, systems related policies and programs. At the end of the day, what we are trying to achieve are these uh, sustainable development goals as articulated in the uh, 2030 agenda. We're looking at uh, healthy diets, food security, poverty reduction, and definitely ensuring that all of that is, is, is going on while not uh, being destructive to our uh, environment so that we can also ensure that future uh, generations can have the, that, that luxury of uh, food security as we are aiming for ourselves. So as men mentioned by Corinna, the UN uh, Food Systems Summit was uh, a pivotal uh, milestone in uh, governments acknowledging that a systemic approach is required for addressing these uh, critical uh, challenges, uh, uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier. So the work that we've heard about today will inform uh, our organization, but also the partners that we work with in responding to the country's call for more uh, uh, tools and guidance on how you actually take uh, this food systems approach. Um, the Food Systems Hub is a core enabler in this respect, and FAO is working with the hub to ensure that these types of learnings and and tools are disseminated as widely as possible at the regional level for instance in the africa region fao is also working closely with the african union for the renegotiation of the uh, post uh, malabo agenda as um, shivon uh, eloquently explained in her interventions. And so uh, these interventions will emphasize the adoption of a systemic approach for the challenges facing agri-food systems in the Africa region and the collaboration with uh, the uh, University College London and the learnings from uh, today will inform that process. Um, Collaboration with our colleagues in the Europe and uh, Central Asia offices and in our uh, regional offices in Latin America and also in uh, Asia, uh, Pacif uh, Asia Pacific also means that these types of products and lessons that, is, that are coming out of this experience can be adapted to the regional context. I think that's very, very uh, important. There is the global, but there is definitely contextualized dimensions to this issue. And so it is important how we work at these uh, decentralized uh, uh, facets of our, our organizational structure. So in short, without leveraging FAO's strategic partnerships, including with regional partners, the scope of what we are learning about today will be limited and, uh, and its potential 
for uh, uh, upscaling for the transformation of uh, agri-food systems will, of course, be hampered. With this, I would like to uh, to also join the call. I think uh, it's it's been made here before, uh, and to reinforce the call to uh, to work with uh, uh, all colleagues and partners so that we can work together to converge our learnings and efforts for. Uh, achieving these uh, transformational changes that uh, we want to see. Our, the FAO Director General, Dr. Chu Dong Yu, articulates this very well in, the, in our strategic vision to support better production, better, a better environment, uh, better nutrition, and a better life for all today, but definitely also tomorrow. So to close, I would like to, to extend uh, immense thanks, first of all, uh, to the government of I Ireland for, uh, for providing the funding of the projects under which we've, uh, we've, fund, we've been able to fund the, uh, this very, very uh, important activity, and uh, definitely to extend our warm appreciation uh, in particular to uh, Professor Rena Kettel from the University College of London and uh, for his team uh, for coming uh, all the way to, to Rome again and to also acknowledge the, uh, the collaboration we've had over the past year with which has made a significant contribution to FAO's work on systems uh, thinking and tools. And definitely to, uh, I, I have here in my notes, uh, Alice, Juliet, Dana, Anderson, and the students of, uh, of UCL who uh, made uh, presentations uh, today. Uh, definitely as well, we would like to express immense thanks to uh, Dr. Peter Jacobs uh, from South Africa and Mr. Tom Arnold from Ireland for, uh, for connecting and making those invaluable contributions that provide us the insights into what, what is happening at uh, country level. And uh, last uh, but not the least, uh, I would like to extend our uh, appreciation and uh, thanks to the uh, the uh, the divisional colleagues, ESF colleagues who made uh, this event uh, happen today. Francesca, Pablo, uh, Martin, and definitely Siobhan for her coordination, and finally for uh, Elena for overseeing all uh, the inputs uh, that contributed to making this seminar a success. So thank you very much for your attendance and wish you a great rest of the day.